neck femur in children uh, and i would ask uh, dr salil upasni to share his screen and start with his talk over to you salil thank you thank you so much and thank you for including me in this excellent course uh, are you able to see my slides yes yes we can okay wonderful thank you so these are my disclosures nothing relevant uh, to this talk i would like to disclose that i just recently read this excellent paper uh, which was published in the Indian um, Journal of Orthopedics. And I recommend everybody please review it because it has a lot of uh, valuable information. So my task this evening is to talk about the femoral neck fractures in the pediatric population. So we all know that this is fortunately a rare injury occurring less than 1% of the time with a little bit higher ratio of boys compared to girls. And the peak incidence of the injury is in uh, the early teens. Uh, these fractures have a very high risk of complication compared to all the other injuries that we treat in children with a potential for long-term disability. So it's actually a very interesting topic because there's lots of controversies in how to address these injuries. So everything from timing of surgery, whether to treat these open or closed, and what type of fixation we're going to use. And the primary issue with these fractures is that the vascular anatomy to the proximal femur is extremely complicated and it changes throughout life. So Ogden and Tueta described these five phases of the vascularity starting in infancy when the blood vessels are uh, freeing, you know, flow, uh, flowing freely across the proximal femoral physis. Uh, but then this changes uh, between five months to four years of age and then again from five to 10 years of age and then in, again in adolescence and in adulthood. So as the uh, blood flow to the femoral epiphysis changes, the different issues that can happen with avascular necrosis uh, continue to evolve. The clinical presentation for these, about half of them are high energy traumas. So anytime you're evaluating a child with a femoral neck fracture, you have to consider polytrauma. You have to look for associated injuries, such as in this child that had these associated pelvic fractures. I find that a traction radiograph performed in the trauma bay is extremely useful because it helps you classify the injury. It helps you figure out the obliquity of the fracture, some of these things that we'll go through in this talk. Uh, for very young children, I'd say less than two years of age, or especially in children who aren't walking yet, uh, one main issue that we have to think about is non-accidental trauma. Uh, and I guess this might be a bigger issue in the Western world. So in terms of low energy mechanism, if, if you see a child with a femoral neck fracture that happened from you know, falling from a sidewalk or falling from standing height, you have to look for pathologic fractures. So the more common issues are unicameral bone cysts, aneurysmal bone cysts. But this child that I treated, you know, initially just diagnosed with a femoral neck fracture, treated with standard three screw fixation, ended up developing Gorham's disease. So completely unexpected and resulted in multiple surgeries and complications. Um, so that's something that you need to consider as well as metabolic bone diseases. So when we classify these fractures, the traditional classification used by Powell's described in 1935 looked at the obliquity of the fracture and he broke it up into three classes, less than 30 degrees, 30 to 70 degrees and above 70 degrees. And as we know, obviously the more vertical fractures are uh, more challenging to treat. And there's some discussion about doing a primary valgus osteotomy to turn these shear fractures into more compression type fractures. But ultimately uh, this classification didn't really have any correlation in terms of complications or guiding the types of implants or treatment that we do. So I think the most commonly used classification system nowadays is this Del Bay classification. One, two, three, and four. One are at the physis, two are transcervical, three are basicervical, and four are intertrochanteric. And I think this is an excellent classification system because it guides treatment as well as giving some prognostic indications for the complications that might occur. So out of that review article that I quoted in the beginning by Pinto and Arjus, you can see that based on the type of uh, fracture you have, you're gonna be associated with different uh, complications that occur. So the most common, common uh, Del Bay type fracture that we see is a type two, followed by a type three, a type four, and then fortunately the type ones are rare. 
Uh, so this review article came out of the CHOP uh, Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia. And uh, this is the article that looks at all the complications that occur with the different Del Bay classifications that are published across uh, the literature. And you can see that the type ones have the highest risk of complications and the poorest outcomes based on that rat lift classification, which I'll go through later. So in terms of avascular necrosis, why does it occur? I think there's three primary causes. <clears throat> One of the main ones is disruption of the retinacular vessels. So the diagram at the top shows the medial femoral circumflex and then the vessels that are riding along the posterior aspect of the neck. So when you have a fracture of the femoral neck, you could have displacement of the fracture resulting in either frank disruption of those vessels or just vessel kinking, which has been shown on multiple arthrogram studies. Um, and that's why anatomic reduction is extremely important to get rid of this kinking and to restore the blood flow into the femoral epiphysis. This concept of increased intraarticular capsular pressure, I think, is uh, traditionally been pretty controversial. Uh, but I'll go through some of these topics um, in terms of decompressing the capsule, decreasing the pressure on those vessels, and restoring the blood flow. One main thing that you want to think about and avoid is terrible iatrogenic injuries like this. So this child presented with a posterior femoral uh, dislocation. You can see that there's a small fracture there, likely avulsion of the ligamentum teres. Uh, but you have to be very careful with these reductions and not cause this type of iatrogenic injury. Uh, so there's some debate, you know, whether the proximal femoral physis was injured at the time of the injury, uh, but definitely with the reduction and with the clear documentation with that CT scan, you can see that uh, it's become a much more severe injury. So tr the main treatment principles of these complicated fractures, I think, your take home points have to be that anatomic reduction is key. I know there's some discussion about an acceptable reduction with two millimeters of displacement or less than 20 degrees of angulation. But really for children, I would try to not accept anything but perfectly anatomic. So in terms of if you're gonna do these open versus closed, if open reduction is gonna give you that anatomic result, um, my preference is to always go open for these. I know there's some discussion about going closed and I'll include some slides in this talk regarding that. In terms of stable fixation, I think operative treatment for almost all of these is now becoming the gold standard. In very young children, you could consider casting, but there's definitely residual displacement that happens even within a spica cast. Uh, in terms of crossing the physis, we try to avoid the physis if we can, especially in very young kids. But ultimately, you got to get this fracture to heal. And if that means that you have to cross the physis for stability, that's what has to come first, as well as a very low threshold for using a spica cast. Uh, so some closed reduction options, there's a couple different techniques that have been described, Whitman, Leadbetter, and Flynn. This is me performing the Leadbetter technique in the operating room. Basically, the concepts are that you're using the capsular ligaments to help control the the proximal and distal fragments of the femoral neck fracture. In the lead better technique, you're actually recreating the deformity by doing that abduction external rotation maneuver. Um, but Flynn has described this kind of less aggressive technique of closed reduction by just using traction, extension, and internal rotation. This child actually ended up going into an open reduction because I didn't, I didn't think that the closed reduction was anatomic enough for me. In terms of timing of surgery, you know, in adults, it's very clear that early reduction is the way to go. In children, it's a little less clear. In that review article that I discussed from CHOP, there's definitely a 4.2 times higher risk of avascular necrosis if you wait more than 24 hours to deal with these fractures. I understand that other series have not demonstrated that benefit of early treatment, but um, the problem with these fractures is that they are rare, and so each individual institution will likely not treat more than, you know, five of these per year. Uh, so most of those studies are underpowered, especially if they're coming from single institutions. So I'd say the general consensus of these is to treat them urgently. I think it is important to have professionals or very experienced surgeons deal with these fractures. So if it takes time to get that team together, somewhere between the 12 to 24 hours period, I think is a good time to approach these. 
Again, capsular decompression, I think this is controversial. The concept behind it is that you're decreasing that intraarticular pressure. And the thought is that bleeding into the hip joint causes an increase in that pressure. And so you're decompressing the capsule either with a needle aspiration. In this uh, fluoroscopic x-ray, we're using a cob slid along the anterior neck to disrupt the capsule. Uh, but I think open reduction is kind of the gold standard classic uh, arthrotomy to open up the capsule and decompress the joint. Again, the systematic review doesn't show a significant benefit to this technique. And that could be for multiple reasons. You know, many confounders, including the type of treatment that you're using, the initial displacement, we discussed those three ways that you could get avascular necrosis. So if you have disruption of those retinacular vessels, obviously decompressing the capsule isn't going to do anything. Um, but I think if you're going to try to minimize your risk of avascular necrosis, you have to throw everything, including the kitchen sink at it. And um, I think opening up the capsule is a very low invasive and potentially beneficial procedure. Tim Schrader from Atlanta has described this technique of using a intracapsular uh, pressure monitor. So this is a Camino probe that's usually used for intracranial pressure monitoring. Uh, and he passes it along within the cannulated screw into the epiphysis to monitor the perfusion pressure in the femoral epiphysis while he's performing these surgeries. So obviously this was described for slip capital femoral epiphysis, which the Del Bay one slip capital femoral epiphysis overlap is uh, definitely present. So in this technique, he uses a cod to decompress the joint and has shown that he's able to reconstitute uh, the uh, femoral perfusion uh, with this ICP probe. Uh, so we were kind of questioning those methodologies, especially performed in the operating room. So we wanted to test this in a animal model to kind of better define how well it works. We wanted to investigate this direct relationship between the increased intracapsular pressure and the femoral epiphyseal perfusion pressure, and also look at the effect of skeletal maturity on this relationship. So, so we actually uh, partnered with Schrader, brought him over to San Diego to perform this study. We used seven Yorkshire hybrid pigs, uh, four younger pigs that were average age of 10 weeks and three older pigs that were over 20 weeks. We had this model set up where we dissected out the capsule of the joint. Uh, these were obviously alive pigs uh, that were sedated during the procedure. We placed a cannulated screw from the femoral neck into the epiphysis using this ICP probe in the femoral epiphysis. And basically we're able to increase the intracapsular pressure by injecting volume into it. And in the younger pigs, all the pigs lost perfusion, femoral perfusion when the intraarticular pressure was increased. And this happened at about 28 or 30 millimeters of mercury above mean arterial pressure. And once we decreased the pressure in the capsule, uh, the intraarticular pressure fell below five, um, the perfusion pressure into the head returned. And in contrast, in the older pigs, no matter how much we increased the pressure within the capsule, we were not able to diminish the perfusion pressure of the femoral epiphysis. And this was very consistently seen in all the trials, basically indicating that the younger pigs are more dependent on those retinacular vessels, which can be compromised by increasing pressure within the capsule. And we did some histology studies on these uh, animals, just showing how that proximal femoral physis is a barrier to blood vessels crossing from the metaphysis into the epiphysis versus in the older pigs, you know, in a pig, you don't actually lose that physis, but what you get is this undulation of that proximal femoral physis. And if we zoom into some of these sections, you can see that we have elastin from the blood vessels that are actually crossing the physis into the epiphysis. So how do we apply this clinically? I think um, it's pretty clear that there is a direct effect of intracapsular pressure on femoral epiphyseal perfusion pressure, especially with an open proximal femoral physis and that you should consider this role for urgent capsulotomy in unstable skiffies or in these intracapsular femoral neck fractures. So let's talk a little bit about fracture fixation. So for Del Bay type one fractures, especially in very young children, uh, again, we talked about considering closed reduction and spica casting in kids less than two, but my preference is to take them to the operating room, put some kind of fixation, uh, and you can consider just smooth pins uh, to stabilize the physis followed by a spica cast. You can pull those pins out in about six weeks, um, four to six weeks um, uh, back, back in the operating room. 
for transficeal. So these could be considered, you know, skiffy type of injuries. In older children, we would definitely do screw fixation across the physis, followed with, uh, with or without a single leg spica cast. For Delbay type twos and threes, which are again the most common types of injuries, transcervical, basicervical, for very young kids, you can again consider closed reduction spica casting, but again, my preference is to take them to the operating room to stabilize. And again, we use smooth pins with a spica cast. As they get older, we can switch over to cannulated screws, uh, starting with 4.5 cannulated screws if they're very young, up to 6.5 or 7.3 millimeter cannulated screws as they get older. Uh, and even older children over than 10, uh, for the same types of fractures, I like to use a sliding hip screw with a derotation screw just because it adds additional stability and we can minimize your time in the spica cast. For type four fractures, which are intertrochanteric, again, these are extra capsular, so I have a much lower risk of avascular necrosis. Closed reduction is okay. Um, and I prefer a sliding hip screw or a proximal femoral locking plate uh, to stabilize these injuries. I'm gonna go through several of these surgical approaches to the femoral neck. Uh, so for Delbay type two, three, and four, so again, transcervical, basicervical, intertrochanteric, my preferred approach is the Watson-Jones or the anterior lateral approach shown there between uh, the tensor and the gluteus medius. For Delbay ones, you can use a Smith-Peterson direct anterior approach, which goes between tensor and sartorius. Uh, you will need a separate lateral incision to place the implants for stabilization. And uh, for Delbay 1s, and especially those type 1Bs, which are dislocation of the proximal femoral epiphysis, I prefer a surgical hip dislocation approach. I know a lot of people think that with a posterior dislocation, you want to go from the back with the Cochor Langenbach. Uh, but I've seen that uh, once you dislocate the joint, you can really address all the pathology within the joint. And I think it's a safer approach to preserve the vascularity which runs along the back of the femoral neck. So let's go through some case examples. This is a 12-year-old male with a left delbay type 2 femoral neck fracture after being thrown from a horse. In terms of radiographs, I think this cross-table lateral is a little bit better in these types of injuries rather than a typical frog lateral. Um, again, so because this is a type 2, I prefer to use the Watson-Jones. I prefer to do it on a radiolucent flat table. I tend to not use a fracture table because I want to have better control of the extremity and a C arm coming in from the opposite side of the table. So this patient is bumped up. Obviously these are just illustrations and depicting the greater trochanter there. The circle is on the anterior superior iliac spine. My incision goes from the center of the greater trochanter um, down the leg, depending on what type of implant you're going to use. Obviously with a, um, DHS, you're going to have a little bit more exposure distally and then going up towards the anterior superior iliac spine. The next layer is between the tensor fascia lata and the gluteus uh, depicted there on the anatomic drawing. You can see that there's the plane between the back of the tensor muscle and uh, the gluteus medius. Once you're dissected into this plane, you can see vastus lateralis. I believe you can see my arrow. Here is the vastus. This is the direct head of rectus inserting on the anterior inferior iliac spine. And this is gluteus minimus and medius. So you're going into that interval. Uh, you're retracting the direct head of rectus to expose the capsule. So intraop showing the capsule exposure uh, on this drawing. You can see uh, the capsule exposed as well as the medial femoral circumflex vessels. And then I do a T-shaped capsulotomy. It starts along the upper rim of the femoral neck cutting down along the inner trochanteric region, which you can see in the interoperative image here. You can see the fracture line visualized very clearly and the head and neck junction uh, going into the acetabulum. So that gives you good visualization of the fracture. Once you have that, these are the tools that I typically use to reduce these, a three millimeter chance pin, which is placed into the proximal fragment. Uh, as you know, that distal fragment is basically displaced by all the muscles that are attaching to it including the abductors attaching to the greater trochanter, the AD ductors, and the iliopsoas. So once you have that proximal fragment under control with the shan screw, you can do traction, internal rotation, and extension of the distal fragment uh, to obtain an anatomic reduction. This is followed by pinning it in place uh, far away from where your definitive implants are going to be, followed by uh, placing these implants. So this is an interoperative image showing that chance pin uh, to control the proximal fragment as well as this pointed reduction clamp uh, to hold a fracture anatomically reduced. 
This is the type of sliding hip screw that I typically use, as well as the cannulated screws, um, depending on the diameter and the size of the patient. So this is how that patient was treated, a derotation screw with a DHS plate. This is him at six weeks post-op and at 18 months post-op with the appropriate um, healing. So a couple other cases real quick to go through. Nine-year-old with a left Delbay type one after a motor vehicle accident. Again, very similar to a Skiffy approach. So I prefer this Klaus Parsch technique uh, using a Smith-Peterson approach to obtain uh, access to the head neck junction, um, resulting in a, in a direct reduction, anatomic reduction that's visualized followed by a lateral incision to place these screws. This patient was also stabilized in a single leg spica with a pelvic band with good two-year follow-up. And this is an 11-year-old male with the right Delbay type 1. And this was treated with a uh, modified Dunn approach through a surgical dislocation, CT scan showing the displacement. Um, this is after exposure of the capsule, uh, showing that it was pinned in place temporarily to dislocate the hip, followed by exposure of the retinaculum uh, with a good um, subperiosteal dissection. Uh, anatomic reduction. Again, this part is extremely important where you're visualizing the blood flow in the femoral epiphysis, as well as checking it with a Doppler to make sure that you have good perfusion. And this was stabilized with uh, two cannulated screws. I always obtain a bone scan in all of these patients at six weeks post-op uh, to evaluate uh, the perfusion of the femoral epiphysis, this patient at two years post-op. So the main complications that you can face with these types of injuries, so avascular necrosis in about 25%, if you average out the different types of del bays. Uh, most of these are associated based on age, initial fracture displacement, the location of the fracture, the quality of the reduction when uh, you, you treat these patients after the injury, as well as uh, open versus closed treatment. I think it's really important to follow these for at least two years because lots of things can show up uh, with longer term follow up. In terms of getting that six weeks bone scan, everyone asks, what's the point? What are you going to do if you know that you have AVN? I think um, knowing is really important for me. It gives me a chance to intervene. It gives me a chance to prepare the family for what is coming up. Um, if I do see a vascular necrosis, I would extend the period of non-weight bearing for a much longer time, which can, you know, include up to six months. Um, and then there's potential interventions that you can do. You know, if you look at the literature for a vascular necrosis, all the better outcomes are if you can address the a vascular necrosis before femoral head collapse. And so that six-week bone scan gives me an opportunity to perform some of these interventions. So you could either drill the head neck junction. Uh, I use this x device to remove the necrotic segment and put in bone marrow aspirate, bone graft, prodense, anything to try to support that femoral head. There's good literature about using vascularized fibular grafts. I personally don't have experience with that. Um, injecting bisphosphonates or bone morphogenic proteins has been shown to decrease the collapse and kind of help restore the head before there's uh, permanent femoral head deformity. And then if you have partial AVN, you can do osteotomies to offload those regions. Some other complications that are pretty common. So Coxavera, uh, this patient we treated recently about a month ago, he had uh, Coxavera after fixation of this uh, Del Bay type three fracture. Um, and you can see the progressive deformity. This was treated with a valgus osteotomy with a, a DHS. Non-unions are you know, unfortunately common um, there's an excellent uh, review article recently published by Sangvi et al. in JBJS uh, looking at the two different types of femoral neck non-unions that you can have. So if you have failure fixation, that could either be from a poor reduction or poor choice of implants. So obviously those are treated with an exchange of those implants uh, with patients with a high Powell's angle, so very vertical fracture. You want to convert those to shear or convert them uh, to make them flatter by doing a valgus osteotomy. Um, if they have a delayed presentation or a fibrous nonunion, um, that paper discussed ways of using a fibula strut graft uh, to connect the femoral head and neck and um, provide stable fixation. I don't have uh, experience with that type of complication. So growth arrest is also pretty common. Uh, this can be a direct injury from the fracture or it can be iatrogenic based on the type of implants that you use. 
and it can result in coxa valga or varus. And basically the treatment options are doing corrective osteotomies to address the proximal femoral deformity. Finally, in terms of outcomes, how do these patients do? Uh, again, from that uh, review article from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, this is the RATLIF classification uh, showing good, fair, and poor outcomes. And based on the type of Del Bay fracture you have, obviously a lot more poor outcomes in the Del Bay type ones. So some take home points for treating these femoral neck fractures are extremely challenging. They require urgent treatment. Again, I encourage you to treat them within 12 to 24 hours of the injury. Anatomic reduction is extremely important. Please don't accept the two millimeters is my recommendation. And I feel that that can best be accomplished with a good open reduction. I think capsulotomies are important to decrease the intraarticular pressure, stable fixation, and consider spica cast based on the age of the patient, the fracture pattern, and how much displacement you have, and always be prepared to deal with complications because they are definitely gonna come. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Superb. So thanks, Salil, for that uh, really masterclass on everything in fracture neck fever in children. And uh, I would urge all the attendees, delegates to type in their questions in the Q&A section in case you have questions. And uh, we will be answering them uh, during the course of the meeting or uh, you will receive an answer from our panel. So having said that, I think we will move to uh, cases of fracture neck femur and I will share my screen and we would like to revise and highlight a lot of points which have already been made uh, by Salil during the course of his talk. So can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is our panel who has contributed to the cases and let's see how many we can cover. We are well within time so far. So I would invite Maulin, Maulin, if you can yeah. talk about your patient. This is so, also uh, the first quiz. Ashok, if you can put up the uh, poll, a two and a half year old child who has been stuck by a car. This is the x-ray. And what do you think is the injury? Poll has started, you can vote. Okay. So, uh, right. So, if you can see, 92% have got it right as Del Bay type 1 neck femur. 1% thought it's a thigh contusion. 4% thought it's a lower femoral fracture. And 3% thought it's a normal x ray. So, over to you, Maulin. Yeah. So, this. Uh... Unfortunately, the primary orthopedic surgeon got only AP X-ray. This child was playing outside the home and was struck by the uh, uh, car. And uh, this was only AP X-ray. And so it was treated as an uh, thigh contusion. Patient was sent home. And uh, after one week, child could not bear weight. So they went to another surgeon who took the lateral X-ray. And again, he could not diagnose. So this is a, a type 1 injury can be missed. The patient was referred to us at two weeks. And we got a uh, frog lateral view, which showed the completely displaced type 1 Del Bay uh, injury. Uh, we took patient to the theater and uh, uh, so type 1. On an Im image intensifier, you can see that the fracture was reducible. In little flexion and internal rotation, we could reduce it completely. And as Salil mentioned, we fixed a couple of smooth pins. Uh, through the physis and we check the stability of reduction uh, and hip spica was applied. So, so, so if I can just interrupt here for a moment, Maulin, yeah. and ask Sheetal and maybe Sandeep and Salim, you have, we have a situation where we do get delayed presentations like these. So at two weeks or three weeks, a transfixion separation that like this traumatic, uh, would you intervene what is the chance of getting a closed reduction or would you still go ahead and open it? Yeah, I uh, think in the, 
but sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Salim. I think in these uh, younger children, it's uh, reasonable to try closed. I, I would I would try closed. You could see the displacement on that X-ray uh, initially, and um, for very young patients, I would accept this closed reduction and uh, fixation with K wires. I think that's a reasonable okay. approach. I wouldn't necessarily open this injury. So if it if it is not satisfactory, you would rather accept the under reduction rather than opening? For, is that what you're because, saying? Because of the delayed presentation, yes. <laughs> all right. So, Sheetal, any Sandeep, comments? Uh, Sandeep, there is a question uh, that if there's a delayed presentation, would you get an MRI done on those kids or not? OK. So how would you answer that? Sheetal, maybe you can take that. Would you get an MRI? I don't think MRI is going to help me uh, you know, or change my plan uh, in this case. But uh, I think these fractures, uh, even though they are physical injuries, they are intracapsular, so they take a little bit more time to heal compared to other, you know, physical injuries, uh, you know, in kids. So, you know, to me, two weeks is not too late uh, for these fractures. That means that I would try to get uh, a, a good reduction. So I probably, you know, if I can't get a good reduction, I, I probably would open it uh, and reduce it. Uh, unless it's like a month out when I think uh, I may just damage something more. I may allow it, but two weeks, I think I would go for anatomic reduction. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I would accept what, what is shown here. You know, I think this, yes. this, you know, is to me, this would be acceptable. So looking at the literature, which says Del Bay one nearing hundred percent AVN, would you put your hand in that and, uh, make the relatives think that you 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 did it and does the MRI help because I think that's the back of the mind of most of the delegates whether an MRI might help you judge vascularity so how true is it you know I would I mean there are perfusion MRIs I mean you know Salil and other hip guys can speak to it but you know my what we have done is done bone scan early not at six weeks like what they mentioned we usually do bone scan in the first week you know, after an injury like this to judge, but that's a post-op thing. Um, we do it for same with the tailors as well. You know, uh, we get an early bone scan to evaluate for blood supply, but we have not done a pre-op bone scan or MRI to okay. look for it because, you know, the vessel so, may be kinked and reduction okay. may just help with perfusion. So mm -hmm. the decision-making doesn't depend on a pre-op MRI. You would still go ahead and fix it, reduce it. I would, yes. Yes. Sandeep MRD, is there any different approach from UK? Uh, can you hear me? No, yes. I, I don't I don't think we would do anything different. We, I don't see many late presenting cases like this. Uh, but yes, I think at some I guess there is a cutoff and beyond which you won't attempt to reduce it, but two, okay. two weeks or three weeks I would still do a close reduction yes. and fix it. Sandeep, Sandeep, in the right. continuation, we have a question that how till how late can you go for close reduction? I mean, in late in cases. And Sandeep, okay. if it is associated hip dislocation, then what you would do at two weeks? Maybe yeah. Or... Salil, you want to take that question? A so, two week yeah. or one B where you have a dislocation with a transfusion separation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of how far out uh, I would look at it. So basically, you know, within a month, I would take it to the operating room because to yeah. see if the epiphysis is still unstable. Um, my preference is to not <laughs> go in if it's reduced. If it's dislocated, you have to go, uh, you know, perform surgery. Yeah, put it back. Um, yeah. So, yeah, how to approach a two year old with a type 1B? Uh, you know, you could, when you're, instead of doing a greater trochanteric osteotomy, you can remove it through the cartilage uh, just by cutting it with a knife and you can suture the abductors back into position. I think that approach still gives you a good 360 view of the joint and it allows okay. you to get to the dislocation from the anterior capsule instead of dissecting posteriorly where the vessels are. So, so I think the message is clear that when there is a 1B, the head has to be put back. We will tackle the complications later. You would open reduce and put the head back in yes. and yes, correct. fix it to the best of your ability, right? Yeah, yes. Okay, so uh, uh, let's move on 
here a little bit. Maulin, this was your X-ray at two years. So yeah. are you happy with the outcome and how was he? Yeah, so child uh, gained full range of motion and uh, 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 they, are, they were very happy. <coughs> and uh, we asked them to follow us up every annual in from now. Yes. Uh, because uh, so, it can lead to a late uh, onset problem. So, uh, so what, what do you think is going to happen here? Viraj, do you think he's going to have problems or nothing will happen? Viraj, you are muted. You are muted. Sandeep, is being a type 1 injury not because of the fixation or the delayed presentation which is there? I no, no, I am not asking you the reason. I am saying, does this child with a facial injury end up with excellent outcomes or there will be problems? There are chances that there could be some problem. Correct. Correct. So the, injury. Yeah, the message of type 1 injury should always be that keep them under observation because at 8 years, this might happen. And uh, you always need to keep these children under longer follow-up. One, for AVN and two, for growth arrest and malunion. So <clears throat> any, any different opinion? Sheetal, would you like to make a comment here? No, I, I think I think you're you're driving the point. You know, facial injuries, you know, around the head is you know, just uh, non-union. It's not AVN. It's also, you know, in very young kids, you are concerned about you know facial arrest as well. Like uh, like in this case, the head has survived, and uh, you know, uh, uh, so long-term follow-up is necessary. Though probably I was just trying to think, could you have diagnosed this at two-year follow-up? You know and not have this deformity go so far that you run out of options of treating it. Right. So uh, right. is there a role of doing, uh, you know, at that point, you know, at two years, if there is something suspicious, uh, can you do an MRI and diagnose it early, like, uh, like a growth arrest, which is, you know, this, this, these are not very common cases. So I wouldn't say that this is, you know, a, right. very, a, a case that you're going to be learning a whole lot from because we may not, we may not see these kind Absolutely. of presentations. Absolutely. So one very fun. related related question: Will you use screw for stability in type one Pfizer? So we'll 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 come to we'll come to that the screws and the issues of the screws later, but uh, uh, it suffices to say that fracture neck femur is interesting not because of the frequency of fractures but the frequency of complications. You won't see many in the year, but when you get one, it is very likely to give you some complications. So let's move to some implant related issues here. Uh, this is a seven-year-old child, Maulin Bhai. Again, this is actually your case. I've put a quiz here. Can you start a poll, Ashok? Seven-year-old type two, what is the implant that you will use? A 4 mm cannulated screw, Austin Moore pins, mini DHS, 6.5 screws, or AO lock plate? <coughs> So this is where that traction radiograph can really help because I feel like we don't really know exactly what type of Del Bay fracture this is. Okay. And also with seven years old, uh, there can be a big weight discrepancy, you know, so the size okay. of the child. So, so, so 100 people have voted and 66% say they will use a four millimeter cannulated screw. 10% want to use Austin Moore pins. 11% would go for a mini DHS. 12% are saying six and a half millimeter screw and 1% want to go for a plate. So are there any guidelines? Uh, what would you do? Um, I will just run the next slide. Uh, Maulin Bhai? Yeah. Uh, I will just run the next slide. So this patient uh, presented to us after two months of primary injury <clears throat> and uh, the child presented with this x-ray. And uh, uh, they uh, apparently... The, they have used the uh, four millimeter cannulated cancellous screws shy of physis. As Salil mentioned, we took a traction film to see. Uh, and Sandeep, can you go ahead uh, with the next slide? Uh, can you? Yeah, that is a excellent. So, so we revised it, but we took a traction film and uh, we found that the screws were four millimeter and they were shy of physis. So probably the screws were smaller uh, in caliber okay. as well as the length. And so okay. we revised so it. So you twice. revised it to a six, six and a half point. screw. Yeah. And okay. And I, you have I crossed a, the physis, I can see. Yeah. The, the thing which I did, I was overzealous. 
so i did an open approach to remove that uh, broken uh, part of proximal screw so i don't know uh, at this point i would not do that and i put uh, 6.5 in some other trajectory you know, if i achieve a good okay. uh, anatomic okay. reduction by closing okay so sheetal do you think yeah. it's a fair job and uh, what is yeah. your comment on the size of implant yeah you know uh, i like on the first question i probably would have chosen the 4.5 screws because i thought that relative to the size and age of the patient it was okay but on the x ray i can certainly see that they are not sufficient so as as you mentioned that age may not be the best indicator for the size of the implant but you know when you put an implant on top of the femur like you know just on top of the skin you could know the relative size of it so you know if if i if you someone just ask me 5 year old what would you do i would say okay 4.5 seems like it would be okay but if the patient is big and if you know the screw definitely <clears throat> on the left side you can see that the screws are much smaller and the right okay. side you know if, if someone had to guess what size screws are on the right side you may not be able to guess that these are 65 or 45 screws just based on an extra because you have to look at the patient as a whole how big the patient is so i yeah. so i agree that the screws were smaller size and the length wasn't sufficient and i see that uh, you revise it to bigger screws longer screws but you have not used a washer i don't know if that's important or not but um so so one of the better. issues in non unions has always been implant failure and choice of screw depending on the width of the neck as well as how much you whether you cross the physis or not do you compromise physis for stability is i think an important issue which needs discussion or is it only the screw and not the fracture line so this is an example where somebody has used six and a half width washer cheetal just to make the yeah. point that you said you said a screw six and a half and a washer and this is what happened so is is the screw the guarantee or is the fracture pattern also important i'd say the reduction is oh. most important and that's a terrible reduction so it doesn't matter what right. implant you do you think that the vertical nature of the fracture also is important here because this looks like a pavel uh, a 3 or a high grade pavel so any comments from andrew regarding uh, these Can reductions I, and fixation can i say something hey yeah dr hello. songo yes yeah. hello everybody thank you that i can participate at this discussion uh, yes This is really a problem and very good cases to discuss the problem. Uh, in our opinion, and you know, we in Bern, we investigated blood supply, stability, and everything like this. You know, we have not to discuss in the primary about the size of the implant. The problem is how the fracture is reduced, how you did it, and uh, what, uh, what is the, the morphology of this fracture. And as you can see here, This is an oblique fracture, a Salter Harris II fracture in principle, and this needs a perfect reduction and good stabilization. And even in our hand, using only 3.5 screws, if you get a good reduction, and then the implant is not of so high importance. What is important in this fracture is always that you cross the physis. Uh, we know this also from other fractures, that means in in a distal a radius fracture in an a, in a superconal fracture if you have not a good reduction a, you need a bulky implants to keep in a, to keep the fragments in place but at the end you will fail and here the problem is exactly not the good reduction and not the size size of the implant yes absolutely this is the reason okay so sandeep we have Thank one you. question that can you use the cross screws rather yeah, than we, we, yeah mm -hmm. so so the thing is as dr shlongo has pointed out the primary reduction is the key the first thing in priority should be a perfect reduction which salil pointed out it's not the screw the screw comes secondary it's the quality of reduction if you don't get it close probably you go for open reduction but make sure your reduction is perfect and then you can decide about the screw size if you believe that you want to use a larger screw because you have a larger neck that's fine but your reduction is primary and the next point that i wanted to raise here now this is another example of a displaced type 2 which was fixed uh, like this and a spica was given which looked pretty okay but if you see 
uh, what happened in some time was the lower screw actually just cut out. It wasn't adequate. And we were lucky that it healed up, but the screw kept on backing off. So the stability issue, are screws alone enough? Or you have to put them in a spica? Because a lot of times people believe that they have done a good compression screw and the screw configuration or the placement of screw add is adequate. So this could this be a solution where you add a side plate to prevent the bending forces and prevent the screws from backing off. So I will run through a few of my own cases here where my philosophy has always been to put the first screw outside the plate to get a primary reduction and stability. But I put a side plate depending on the size, either 6.5 or 4 mm, but I always use a side plate. And this obviates the need for putting a spica because I just use a long leg knee brace in them. And that is the way I use to in enhance stability. And the second point that was raised was, should we cross the facial plate? So as I said, reduction quality, combination implant choice, whether you use a pin or a screw and whether you cross the growth plate. These are the issues which give stability. In the olden days, people have used the SP pin and plate also with the AM pin, but the side plate gave excellent stability and has prevented backing off even in a vertical fracture. And as Salil pointed out, in the older adolescent age groups, obviously a pediatric DHS does uh, the job quite well. So I would like Cheetal to just summarize in order of preference, what would be his approach to stability of the fracture as far as implant goes? No, I think the number one thing is anatomic reduction. You know, I, we all agree with that. Uh, you know, um, I think it's important for healing of the fracture. Uh, uh, the, the next thing is the, um, uh, is the uh, implants. Now, you know, even in your x-rays, even though the fracture healed, some of the screw threads were in the fracture. So I would like to point out that, you know, go long, you know, your, your thread should not be at the fracture side because they are going to hold it apart. So you have to cross the fracture. Don't worry about crossing the physis. I think you should cross the physis to get a longer screw and more stability into the proximal fragment. Uh, number number three is, uh, you know, you're, uh, someone who was asking about cross screws. The reason to, do, to put parallel screws is to allow for a little bit of a collapse if there is some absorption at the fracture line, because that, you know, that invariably happens with intracapsular fractures that you may have some absorption so if you have parallel screws, it would allow for a little bit of collapse and that would allow your, your screws may back out a bit, but that would allow your compression. So I would not go with cross screws because that would not allow for any further collapse. And um, so I would go with, try and go parallel screws and get good compression. But if stability is in doubt, that means once you put your screws in, if you see that there is not enough compression across the fracture or I mean, if you think that, you know, when you move it, you are concerned about stability, I don't mind adding a spica on, you know, if the patient uh, especially has some ADHD or is not going to follow recommendations, it's, it's better to just, you know, your whole thing here is to be on the safer side Then you know, motion is not an issue, you know, stiffness is not something that I'm concerned about, concerned about, you know, stability and healing of the fracture. So if in doubt, I would add the spike after, after screw fixation. Uh, Salil, 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 what is your opinion? Unmute. Sorry. Salil, you need to unmute. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no problem. I was just... Sorry, my so, opinion on what? Say it again. On the side plate, because the AO has now come up with the side plate with a locking yeah. option and a compression option. So yeah. is screws only a good option or a side plate is mandatory? Or if you put a plate with a screws, then spica can be avoided. No, yeah, I think screws alone is is definitely adequate. I think if you get a good reduction and bone on bone uh, stability, screws is definitely adequate. Uh, I think in the older children, heavier children, adding that side plate is a great addition. And I agree with your ability to resist the varus that happens uh, through the fracture site. Uh, but I also prefer to use that single leg spica. I think it's very... Uh, not terrible for the families to tolerate a single leg walking spica. And um, 
I think most of these kids who are wild and crazy enough to get these fractures deserve to be slowed down for a few weeks in that spica cast. So I I prefer okay. to use it. So, most so Maulin Bhai, you, you have a comment? Yeah, I have a question for uh, all, Sandeep, all the fractures. There are multiple questions regarding fracture neck uh, uh, screw configuration and okay. uh, of uh, novel pins. Multiple times people have asked. So I think you just consider that do you use fully threaded screw one uh, partially threaded and one fully threaded screw or in, and use one right angle screw and which are the cases in which you will use K-wire and novel pin. Okay. So these this is a slide that I just put up with literature support which says that cannulated screws allow compression but there is to be mandate, there has to be anatomic reduction but they don't have a control over varus collapse because there is no side plate. Sliding hip screw with anti-rotational screw gives both compression with weight bearing and a locking side plate adds the uh, stability for a varus collapse, but the locking screw do not really give ability to compress. So these are the highlights of uh, the various implants available. As Sheetal pointed out, I think parallel screws allow collapse and the adult configuration of an inferior calcar screw, which was being talked about, so the Lundquist uh, paper has actually said, don't put a central screw. They said, put it posterior or inferior within three millimeters of the calcar for the best hold. So this was a little bit of literature. So uh, if Cheetal can summarize again for so the Sandeep, questions you know, that have your, been asked. Your point, about, uh, your point about the previous slide where you said about the implants, you know, that is also based on your fracture. You know, you just can't, yes. all neck fractures are not the same. So... You know, if you have a very proximal fracture, I don't think a side plate is going to do much of, uh, you know, uh, advantage. You know, whereas, whereas if you have a, an intertroch fracture or if you have a basal fracture, I think the side plate would be of more benefit. So I, I don't think that you can just because a side plate has a lot of advantages that you have to use it in every neck femur fracture. You know, screws are sufficient for more proximal fracture configuration. I think uh, Dr. Slongo was raising his hand. He had a comment. Uh, Sheetal, there is one more question. I think Salil can answer that in uh, what is the oldest stage you will use screw and spica and when will you not use spica in fracture neck femur? Okay, let is there a role go. for K-wires or That's people indeed. are asking about pins and K-wires? I think Dr. Slongo had a comment. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, Sandeep showed before his uh, technique with the side plate or the, the plate as a washer and this was exactly what we did always since nearly 35 years, uh, uh, indicated by Professor Gans. And uh, this was also the idea behind this uh, uh, locking plate for, from the AO side. And uh, you have the luck that the godfather of this plate is sitting here, that's me, uh, you know. <laughs> and again, what is important? What we should achieve? We should achieve First of all, of course, uh, anatomical reduction, but after anatomical reduction, at good stability. So the question is uh, uh, to prevent virus and to get stability. So we don't need in kids compression. And the, uh, the, the goal of this plate is to give, is, is in principle uh, an angular plate plate system without plate plate. So in this picture, this is an old picture. This is wrong. Uh, the picture should go with the screw in the, in the head. But anyway, the problem is here, or not the problem, the advantage is, here it's okay. The advantage is you have an angular stable, uh, stable situation. You don't need compression. You can get compression, as you can see here with the first screw as a, 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 a compression screw. But this is not the issue in a pediatric patient. In the pediatric patient, the stability is the issue. So in our hand, then the recommendation of the pediatric expert group from AO and AO is nowadays independent. And this, I do not agree that the fracture, uh, uh, the site of the fracture has an influence for any kind of fracture, lateral, mid shaft, a mid cervical or basic uh, medial, all fracture can, fi can be fixed with this plate. And in the meantime, we have 50 or 10, 12 years of experience and we have not seen one failure. But you know, even in this presentation now and the discussion, we have seen failures and complications with single screws and with other implants. So we cannot longer accept this. So we should go for an implant 
which gives the highest, highest security for the child. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. So I think we'll just move on. Uh, roughly, on age, if you see less than three smooth pins with a spike, I should know that between three and eight, four mm, or a pediatric chip screw, eight plus six and a half screw, or a side plate. Uh, add a spica. Don't be hesitant to put a spica if your stability is not adequate, as been pointed out. And uh, there could be some extended indications in polytrauma. So let's move on to another uh, situation. In India, we do get late presentations. They just don't come in time. So five-month-old delayed presentation. Ashok, can you put the uh, quiz here again? Would you fix in C2 with a DHS, five-month-old, fix with a cannulated screw, do a primary valgus osteotomy, or do a pedicle graft, muscle pedicle graft, as was uh, published in some series. So let's see what people have to say about a late presenting comminuted fracture. In, in most of the times, these children are treated by bone setters or just keep on walking and the neck really fragments. So, yeah, so this, this is not a pathologic fracture, it's just, just no, delayed. no, no, it's just a traumatic fracture. It was this was a 12 year old girl, so. 83% have spoken of a primary valgus osteotomy. So, Salil, do you agree? You made a brief mention of a primary valgus osteotomy. What are the yeah. indications? Because I did not find any paper in children which spoke of a primary valgus osteotomy. Yeah. In adults, I mean, yes, but in not in children. If you consider this delayed presentation as primary, then yeah, I think this is an ideal indication for it. Um, best way to turn those into compressive forces. So. Yes. I don't think okay. in a fresh fracture there's an indication for it in in children, uh, but in a delayed presentation, old maybe. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Shlongo, you wanted to say something? No, no, it's okay. I uh, okay. completely agree. I voted also for primary valgus osteotomy with the 140 right. degree plate. The 140. Correct. So this is this is what. Um, yes, this is what I did uh, in C2 cannulated 6.5 screw, and then we did a. Uh, oblique osteotomy and converted that into a valgus, 140 degree uh, side plate and fixed it. Uh, and that went on to a very good healing. So uh, in delayed but presentation know, where, sorry. Sorry, but you know, uh, the problem, you know, when we started with the pediatric hip plate, we made a failure and we, the first valgus plate was exactly sh the shape of your plate, uh, but this creates a biomechanical failure so therefore, we change to the, 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 the straight plate 140, which yes. allows lateralization because lateralization. Yes. By a mechanical yes. problem. Yeah, this but was one was of the cool. older ones. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, when you have adequate bones. So just a primary valgus osteotomy to station which healed in three months uh, and did very well is a good option if you have good bone stock and good contact there. So I would invite Sandeep Vaidya now to talk about his case. Sandeep, are you on? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Sandeep. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this was an adolescent girl, a 14-year-old girl who presented with a neck femo fracture. As you can see, it was a Delbe type 2. And this was treated elsewhere. And this is how it was fixed. So we have already, you know, enumerated the principles of, uh, you know, primary treatment. And you can see there are multiple things which are wrong in this, in this fixation. The screws are not of adequate diameter. The orientation or the placement of the screws is not correct. They are mostly in the superior quadrant. Plus, uh, the screw should have been, you know, inserted more deeper. The inferior screw should have been more deeper in the head. So this was an invitation for failure. Next slide, please. And that is exactly what happened. Uh, the, there was an implant failure. So now we can see that uh, the fracture has collapsed into virus and there is a non-union. And this is how the child now presented to us. So as, uh, you know, Sandeep uh, mentioned in the previous, uh, you know, his, his uh, case, uh, this is an ideal indication for a valgus osteotomy. By valgus osteotomy, we would be uh, achieving two objectives. One thing is we would, you know, correct the virus, the existing virus and convert it to a valgus. And plus the forces which are acting across the fracture site, we would convert them from shearing forces to compressive forces, which would aid in healing of the fracture. Additionally, the osteotomy is known to increase the blood supply to the fracture site, which, uh, which helps in the healing. And that is what happened in this case. We can go to the next slide. 
And as you can see at uh, one year follow-up, the fracture has completely healed with no evidence of avascular necrosis. So uh, to uh, you know, summarize, valgus osteotomy is a very useful procedure and effective procedure which you can use in uh, you know, complicated situations like delayed presentations and non-unions. And uh, it is a very useful procedure in those circumstances. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you. Yeah, so do you think that's that uh, the, the, implant, the DHS implant uh, that we used was a little bit bigger than uh, for the size of the kid? Like you have, uh, or is this a pediatric DHS? Yeah, the problem uh, with the, uh, the implants that were at, available at our disposal was that the valgus plate, this was almost, I think, a 150 degree plate, which was not available in the pediatric range and I had no option but to go for this. Uh, okay. Okay. One quick comment uh, with the with the valgus osteotomy, would you consider a lateral closing wedge? Because I think you made a straight transverse yeah. cut and then tip the proximal fragment into valgus. Uh, usually, so. uh, the 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 opening wedge is what I do, but uh, I'm open to any suggestions of the panelists. You you perform the lateral closing wedge. Yeah, I just prefer to have more kind of bone on bone compression instead of the opening wedge. So similar to a closing medial for varus, uh, closing lateral for valgus, but this healed extremely well, so. But and the, what is the ideal level of valgus osteotomy is the question. Yeah, but this is also always the same question when we develop a, a pediatric heat plate. You know, especially in the States, this is the tradition that you make the cut in this way that you can perform compression. But this is absolutely a, a old history and not necessary. You can do this in, even in older children or teenager, you can make open wedge for virus or valgus osteotomy and it heals always, uh, as you see here. But you see another point again, this plate creates a biomechanical failure. Of course, the first goal is to bring it to heal and we are all happy that it heals. But of course, in the second point, we have a biomechanical failure and we have to respect this. So with the pediatric heat plate, you can treat both. You can make the correct biomechanical axis as well to bring the fracture to heal. Yes. So that's a point well made, Dr. Longo, that lateralization of the shaft is an important thing which the new plates can achieve uh, on its own. So let's move on to a more de delayed presentation and a quiz here again. Uh, a 14-year-old boy who came one and a half year after injury with a gap non-union like this. So would you do reduction with open reduction with bone grafts or in situ fibula with fixation or add an osteotomy or do pedicle grafts? I'm missing a fifth option. I'm missing a fifth <laughs> option. Okay. So most of the people, 77% want to use a fibula with a valgus osteotomy, and 10% wanted to open this. Okay, so let's see what happened. This was one of the cases which very smartly went and to us and And they yes. bless, us here, yeah. bless us here what the fifth option is. What yes. do you think would be the fifth option? Uh, the yes, fifth option is here for us, uh, it's clear uh, surgical hip dislocation or uh, I, a modified done procedure a approach. We go for a, to open the hip. We see, we make the debridement, we make a, a distalization of the plantar mayor, and then in addition, a valgus osteotomy, like the old, the old uh, morpher osteotomy, but today it's not in this way. We do this with the new plate, and we will not use fibula graft. We have many of such cases from outside of Switzerland, uh, from immigrants. A present in this situation, and we could treat really 100% of these cases successfully in this way. Okay. But, uh, I'm sorry, so, you said valgus osteotomy, and what else? Uh, what? How would uh, you? No, of course we make a, a, a good de a debridement of, of the femoral neck. Uh, see what is with the blood supply. We make an anatomical reduction, but the, uh, and bring it together. But in the same time, the valgus osteotomy, uh, okay. uh, but no graft. No graft, no. Oh, no, especially not fibula graft. Okay, so uh, this is uh, what we did, Taral and myself at the IFIX course. Exactly. We see a lot of these cases, 
and we do do a fibular graft with valgus osteotomy and uh, a lot of papers have proven that uh, this works quite well and this did heal and despite the head looking fragmented and avascular it revascularized and this uh, latest follow up of this child child is comfortable and actually the child the neck healed well but there was a cam lesion there was a bump there which uh, during plate removal when it does has gone and removed the implant and did an osteoplasty for this child so that is the latest follow up of this child after 4 years so this was 2016 and uh, we are in 2020 so uh, we did not open we did not debride but we supported with a valgus osteotomy and a calcar we put the fibula along the calcar and we stabilized with plate so we we wrote a review article on uh, non unions in neck femur which uh, uh, dr salil was referring to uh, uh, sahil uh, myself ashok karan and temal and we contributed to them for the uh, attendees if you have a non union of the fracture neck femur it could be because of two things either failure of fixation or in our country as we see delayed presentation what are the points to look for if it inappropriate fixation or a wrong choice of device or a implant which broke and there was a biomechanical failure if there is no infection remove the implant stabilize it and do a valgus with good stable implant and that should work well but if there is neck resorption fibrous tissue rule out a pathological fracture then you could use a neck reconstruction using stud grafting of fibula or uh, and add a valgus osteotomy and fix with a stable implant adequacy of reduction to best practice is to prevent non union this is a review of literature all the papers that have been published so far adequacy of reduction is always the key to prevent non union if you cannot get a good close reduction do an open reduction a stable fixation your implant choice is important you could add a side plate cannulated screws then add a spica for older children you can use an implant with a side plate if the neck is resorbed fibula is a good choice a good calcar contact is essential judicious valgus osteotomy and always a dynamic hip screw if it is a uh, older child which can take a sliding hip screw so let's move on to dr sarwar salam from bangladesh He has an interesting case. Sarwar, can you just unmute yourself? Oh, uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So this this is a 13 year old girl came from the southern part of Bangladesh, Chittagong, and uh, presented to us three months after the in- injury. So apparently it looks uh, like a little bit too, but uh, probably some part of the head is also lost. if you can see uh, it is two but probably some part of the head is lost so uh, the next slide please so there's a quiz for you yeah could you do a close reduction and open reduction use a graft or add an osteotomy again same options which we have spoken about also sandeep sir your voice is slightly breaking Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry for that. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. sir. Okay. Okay. So most of them now want to do a fibula set and a subcutaneous valgus osteotomy. What do you do, sir? Oh, the next slide, please. Yes. so we did that we did uh, open reduction uh, valgus osteotomy we uh, gave us fibula start graft and fixation uh, after the surgery we had some dissatisfaction that uh, the screw the lower screw was uh, smaller and we could do a little more valgus or, or a proximal valgus but things went be- uh, good i think 3 month post op 6 month post op we can see that it was united and this is 13 month post op she was working beautifully she was 14 by then. i think everybody was happy at this stage sir what is yeah, it yeah yeah i was so happy also <laughs> but 18 month post op there were some changes in the head 
I, I was I was uh, aware of it, and uh, so I asked them uh, not to go for strenuous exercises, and uh, if needed, use a stick. And she was doing uh, so, and she came back. This is pretty uh, two month post op, and she was unable to work. And uh, this was it, it was in my clinic, and she was working with the aid of someone else. And it, you can see the X rays. More avian there, and this is a three month old history. Now it is 25 months. What do we do? Remove the hardware, wait and observe, roll up this postponents and future plan. So Salil, Chital, Sandeep, any takers? Yeah, no, no great solutions. How old is the patient? Now, now she is 15. Yeah, so in at our institution, the child would go on for a total hip arthroplasty. Obviously, that's not a great option for, for you guys. Um, but I think, um, you know, most likely just taking out all the implants and observing, giving it time. I don't think bisphosphonates and BMPs are going to help that head. There's obviously destruction on the other side of the joint as well, the acetabulum. Um, the youngest total hip we've done is 11 years old, and we have good... Uh, you know, five-year follow-up on all the kids under 30 that have had total hips. I think that's the best way to regain her function and uh, get rid of her symptoms. But, so she would get a total hip in uh, San Diego? Yes. Okay, Sheetan? You know, uh, once it has started to collapse, it's very difficult to uh, to salvage the, uh, the hip. You know, you can try everything and we have... Uh, you know, have tried a lot and uh, I agree with Salil that, you know, eventually it will go for a total hip, you know, removing the okay. pain or if the hardware is in the joint may give a temporary relief of her symptoms. Yeah. Uh, eventually, okay. she would need, I think, I know if, if, it's a, if it's a stage two ABN where there is no collapse, then I think you, you can try the bisphosphonates and injecting, you know, BMP as well. Um, uh, and then we have tried a lot of different stuff, including a, a fibular strut graft, uh, you know, to prevent a collapse along with bisphosphonates and, B, uh, you know, um, uh, BMP injections, but that is pre-collapse. Once it has collapsed, you know, I don't think that all those salvage, uh, you know, uh, you know, attempts to salvage the head are going to be effective. So, you know, I think in the, the, the neck of the femur fracture discussion would end here, you know, once you have an AVN, because this is a yeah. whole new subject of, you know, treatment of AVN. It doesn't, you know, you have to send them to your uh, hip guy. Okay. Dr. Slongo? Uh, first of all, I go back to the, the case itself because, you know, I guess in my hand, uh, of course, we the, the principle of the treatment would be the same, that, but we would do this by really in a clear, open way by surgical hip dislocation to avoid any damage of the vessels. But in your case, or uh, what I have seen up to now, you make something uh, half open, half not open or closed, and not in a perfect uh, reduction. So you never know exactly what happens with the blood supply. Because before you made your correction, the, the head looks good and had no sign of AVN. So the AVN is related to the search and there is no doubt and we, we must be honest to this. So now we have the AVN and I get a, such, a, have such a case actually a, in the clinic from Egypt. A, in our hand and what I learned from Professor Gans is give in a child's hip a chance. That means even in this, this uh, disaster, we are going for a surgical hip dislocation. Look how it looks inside. Perhaps we find something that we can increase uh, the, the situation for more five to six to 10 years. I'm sure that, th that, can, that the patient will end up in a total hip. So okay. the total hip, to do a total hip in a 10-year-old child is the simplest thing you can do. This is not the question you can do it on it. The question is here, makes it sense. So in Bern, we have a lot of such patients from Africa. We go mostly in young patients for a, then for a hip arthrodosis for 10 years. And once the okay. patient is 25, 30, we go for a total hip. 
total hip replacement. Thank you very much. I just like to make so a comment that is, you know, while, yeah, while these osteotomies are heroic, the 207 participants on this shouldn't be doing, you know, four or five part proximal femoral osteotomies to try to address these very complicated deformities. So yes. I don't think it's a great option for the vast majority of people to do Absolutely. a surgical dislocation, a valgus, a, you know, four part proximal femoral osteotomy because you're gonna cause more problems than just observation even. So, right. so, I, so I just briefly, I'll doing. just briefly run through the AVN as we don't have much time remaining now for this session. Uh, the overall incidence has been published by Moon and Melman is about 30%, the highest being closer to the physis and the lowest as you move away from the physis. And there are contrasting reports depending on whether timing of surgery causes AVN, intraarticular hematoma. Salil has all, already pointed out the direct correlation between quality of reduction and incidence of AVN and an early diagnosis with bone scan. They found that uh, older children were 1.14 1 times more likely to develop AVN uh, with each year of increasing age. Between type 1 to type 3, 15 times, 6 times, and 4 times higher. And as per Delbe class, it was 38%, 28%, 18%, 5%. So we know that it could be a total head or only a sectoral or a neck AVN. And uh, the options, Salila has already pointed out, core decompression, a fibular graft, systemic bisphosphonates, oral or IV, or intraosseous bisphosphonate. But we are still unsure that results may not be any better. Aim is to maintain motion and, and preserve function. So sometimes you get away with an AVN like this, which also heals on its own and nothing needs to be done. So this is another case of a 14-year-old male who had a type 3. Dr. Binoti's case had fixed it with cancellous screws and developed a sectoral AVN, fortunately. They gave oral bisphosphonates. At 18 months, this, this is how it looked. And at implant removal, they took off the implant and I think they injected some bone marrow and uh, over a period of time, they have retained function. And let's go back to Molin. If you remember this case of yours, yeah. so we have seen this. If you can just finish this case. Yeah. So can you go just once uh, the previous slide? Sir? Previous yeah. slide. So Salil, this was a traction film I obtained before I, I went in. And we can now comment that these are really short uh, screws, short of, uh, and there's not a stable fixation. So, uh, yeah. And uh, we divide this 6.5. And at eight months, for, the things were rosy. At eight months, follow up, this ended up into AVN and uh, chondrolysis. And the patient was uh, not very affording a daughter of vegetable vendor. And uh, I... We, did, we asked them to do uh, implant removal and uh, another attempt at uh, osteotomy, but they, they say we, we are not going to get any surgery done. So I removed the implant and performed the girdle stone osteotomy and gave traction. I told them that uh, we can do a resection, angulation, osteotomy and lengthening, but her function was good uh, and they, they did not want to do any other surgery. Can you go to next slide? And, and she get, she got this decent function after girdle stone. Uh, she limps while walking, but uh, she can manage the profession. She can help her parents now. Thank you, thank you. So I think uh, we are at uh, 7.45 and uh, I will stop sharing my screen here. We have uh, spoke. Sandeep, uh, just interrupt. Yeah. One very important point, I think uh, all of us forget that we have to give more time for the counseling of the child and parents that the AVN is going to happen and it is because of injury and not the fixation or whatever treatment you are going to do. I think most of us, we just not, I mean, forget many of time because of the all workload. So that is, I think the very important point we have to emphasize on parents being orthopedic surgeon. Yeah, Viraj, it's a good point, but as pointed out by Dr. Slongo and many others, quality of reduction is also responsible Urgency of surgery is also somewhat responsible. You can't blame everything on the injury itself. And if you do the best job, the best implant, and follow the biomechanical principles well, your chances will be lower. So it's a so it's good message. I think we should hand over the mic and the presentation to Dr. Andrew Pennock, who's ready with his talk on tibial fractures. Is that okay, Andrew? 
Absolutely. Okay. Can you share your screen? Yep. So let's move away from the hip to the tibia and then we'll go to the ankle and foot. Is my screen showing? Yes. So <clears throat> we're gonna focus on tibia fractures and then I believe we're gonna transition more to physeal fractures pertaining to the ankle. So um, I'll try to make this pretty uh, succinct, but tibia fractures are the third most common long bone fracture in children after the forearm and the humerus. They represent 12% of the trauma uh, related procedures that we do. Certainly the mainstay treatments is conservative treatment. So long leg casting. Uh, fortunately, most of these do well. I think the key is recognizing which ones don't. This is a nice study that was just published by Cruz and Kleiner looking at uh, American uh, hospital database. So this is for inpatients, uh, tibia fractures or patients with tibia fractures that are admitted. And over the last two decades, there's been a steady increase in the number of patients that we're fixing surgically. Uh, this number has gone from almost 50 to percent to almost three quarters of these now in the United States being managed surgically. And there's certainly a strong age association. So younger patients under the age of six are largely being treated non-operatively, which is not surprising. But certainly by the time you get to later adolescence, the vast majority of these are going to surgery. And I think this really highlights the lost art of casting in this country. Um, this is, uh, we're a big teaching center with a lot of residents and fellows and medical students. And one of the things we emphasize is uh, casting technique. I think the tendency is a lot of people wanna roll these tibia casts uh, holding the leg in this position with the patient supine. And the tendency when you do this is it'll fall into recurvatum. So a nice little trick is uh, having the leg held off the side of the bed, rolling the cast in two parts. Uh, the first part is, rel uh, is rolled up to the level of the knee. Once the first part is solidified, then bringing the patient into this normal position and converting it to a long leg cast. I think our, uh, it's important to know what we're shooting for, what our goals are on a reduction. <laughs> Ideally, you're going to get uh, the tibia within five degrees of anatomic position, both on the AP and the lateral uh, view. I think a five to 10 degree deformity is um, still well accepted um, and well tolerated for most patients. Certainly what we want to avoid is when they have residual angulation more than 10 degrees. And this tends to be the problematic group that's going to give you uh, trouble. A uh, nice study by um, uh, Mauricio Silva up the road up in LA, published it about five years ago, looking at the role of cast wedging. They had a series of several hundred patients that underwent wedging. Most of them were forearm fractures, but they did have 50 tibias that were wedged. They typically wedge these patients at about 10 days after their injury, a mean wedge of about two centimeters, and they could achieve coronal improvements by four degrees and sagittal plane improvement by two degrees. Uh, they were able to save, or the vast majority of these patients, they could save a subsequent trip to the operating room. So a 96% success rate. And they have they must have better success than we do in San Diego because they have no, they have no reported skin complications and no uh, compartment syndrome. But I will tell you in San Diego, we have had some skin issues with wedging. So we're a little bit more cautious about pursuing it, but certainly it is a nice option. This is a study that we performed about four years ago. So we looked at all the adolescent fractures that came in who required a reduction. And then we looked to see which patients had success with closed treatments and which ones went on to the operating room. So we looked at uh, their baseline demographics. We also looked at their radiographic findings. And what we found was that initial fracture displacement and an associated fibular fracture were largely predictive of that patient needing to go to the operating room. So more or less where the closed treatment failed. We found that if they had neither of those two, the vast majority, 96% of them could be treated with a cast. 
if they had one of those two factors, a third of them eventually went to the operating room. And if they had both of those, at least in San Diego, two thirds of these patients ultimately went on to surgery. For those patients that go on to surgery, I think you have a bunch of options and um, partly it depends on what implants you have available at your institution. It partly depends on what your comfort level is. And it also depends on what the age of the patient is. Uh, Kirshner wires or K-wires certainly work. This is a patient from our institution. I think this can be a useful technique in younger patients. The issue becomes wound and skin issues with this technique. Uh, I tend to favor putting a few leg screws. If it's a long oblique fracture, a few leg screws, you don't have implants coming through the skin. It's not that much more expensive um, and it tends to work well. Elastic intramedullary nailing is the workhorse uh, in the United States, especially for the kids between the ages of probably eight and about 14 for kids that are going to the operating room. Uh, I'll publish a study that we did looking at ORIF, which still uh, is a good technique. And I think across the United States, and I, I can't I speak to beyond that, there's more and more interest about rigid nailing, particularly the early adolescence with open growth plates. And I'll talk about that a bit. So technique for elastic uh, intramedullary nailing. At our institution, we propose a, a two nail construct. We tend to use titanium flexible nails. We start the nails proximally, medially, and laterally. Um, <clears throat> we measure the canal width initially. Typically, these canals will be about 10 millimeters. We shoot for filling 80%. So if we want an 80% fill on a 10 millimeter uh, uh, canal, we'll need two four millimeter flexible nails. So four plus four is eight, that's about an 80% fill. We advance the first um, flexible nail to the level of the fracture. We then advance the second uh, nail to the level of the fracture. We advance the first one about an inch to get control of the distal piece. Then we advance the second one. Once both are across the fracture site, we drive them both down, leave them shy of the physis and cut them proximally underneath the skin. While this technique works, it's not without its own issues. So this is a series that we uh, just sent to JPO, should be coming out in the next few months. It was from three institutions, so Texas Scottish Rite, San Francisco, as well as San Diego, about 200 patients treated with flexible nails. So about half of these patients have a, a really good radiographic outcome. So uh, residual deformity is less than five degrees. What we are a little surprised about is that 43% of these patients will have a residual deformity between five and 10 degrees. Most of these were more of a radiographic deformity. Only one of the patients actually complained of a symptomatic malunion in this group. But what we did have is that 14% of patients treated with these flexible nails had a residual deformity greater than 10 degrees. We've shown that it's two primary risk factors. It's patients with initial open fractures, so higher trauma, higher energy injuries, and also those fractures associated with a compartment syndrome. So what we're thinking is that these are the patients that are acquiring multiple trips to the operating room. They're often the patients that aren't in a cast initially, and those uh, multiple trips to the operating room and the Casts coming on and off, I think, predispose uh, uh, in part to this. It's also the higher energy nature of these injuries. Um, but I think it is important to recognize that residual deformity can occur with a flexible nail. So uh, we do have several providers at our institution that prefer, prefer uh, open direction internal fixation as an alternative to flexible nails for these. So this is another study we published about three years ago. We found that the patients that were treated um, with the plates had a shorter duration of casting. They had a shorter duration of weight bearing restrictions. They healed with less angular deformity and they had a lower rate of implant removal. Uh, there was a trend, it was not statistic statistically significant though, that the ones that we treated with a plate had more wound issues. Unfortunately, the vast majority of them could be treated with oral antibiotics and local wound care. 
And I think the questions come up of, should we be rigid nailing more of these or how much do we need to respect that proximal tibia physis? And I'm mainly a, a sports surgeon where I'm not doing trauma. So not infrequently, I am putting a soft tissue graft across that physis when I'm doing a transphysial ACL reconstruction. And our rates of uh, either having an angular deformity or premature physial closure when we do this for ACLs is, is exceedingly rare. For those that do kind of telescopic nails with the fossa de vol nail, which crosses that physis, once again, the rates of having uh, complications with that proximal tibial physis are quite rare. So should we consider putting rigid nails across that proximal tibia physis, which will give us more stability with our construct, early weight bearing, um, it's something that's being considered and certainly at our institution in that 12 to 14 year old age group, uh, we're more aggressively pursuing rigid nails. I think a few fractures I just wanna highlight which are unique to pediatric patients where uh, you need to recognize this is what we call the Cozen fracture. So this is a proximal metaphyseal fracture, primarily involves the medial cortex. The primary issue with these is they can go into valgus. And some of this might be the fact they're left in valgus initially, but what probably happens in many of these cases, you have hyperemia, increased blood supply to that proximal media tib medial tibia while it's healing, which leads to the overgrowth of that medial side. This is what's been described by Aronson in animal studies where they've cut the periosteum showing preferential growth on that side. Fortunately, the vast majority of these will correct, but you should warn the families about this. And occasionally it will be necessary to do guided growth or other treatments as they get closer to skeletal maturity. A toddler's fracture, uh, obviously it's a very straightforward fracture. The problem becomes is that some of these, you will not see an initial uh, fracture on the x-ray. And our emergency department will often call us saying, hey, we've got a two-year-old with a toddler's fracture. And I think the important thing is don't miss an infection. So if we do not see uh, the fracture on the x-ray, and if there is not an absolutely clear history of trauma, a kid that fell off a bike or fell off the trampoline and immediately began crying, if it's more of a vague history, we pretty much always get infection labs to make sure we're not missing something else. The treatment of these is easy. You can ignore them, immobilize them, pretty much anything you'll do and they'll heal fine. I think the importance is not missing something else. And then finally, there's a Gillespie fracture. So this is a distal metaphyseal fracture. Uh, it is typically from an axial load on a dorsiflexed foot. I think it's often underappreciated these fractures initially are going into a recrovitum deformity. The tendency that occurs with our trainees is they then treat them with the ankle in neutral flexion, which doesn't reduce this. Uh, I think this is the one tibia fracture that we will treat and will cast and plant our flexion. So I think that's an important thing just to recognize this fracture pattern so that you can optimally treat it. And then anytime you're uh, treating uh, tibia trauma, just some important things to consider. Don't miss or don't confuse a congenital pseudoarthrosis. Don't forget about pathologic fractures. non uh fibromas can contribute to these, can create weak spots in bone. And certainly in the United States, we have a problem with non-accidental trauma. Um, and these will come up. This is your classic corner fracture, a nice little uh, study that went into more non-accidental trauma showing a corner of fracture in a femur and a kid, a child that unfortunately died, but here's a specimen showing actually that corner fracture and what you're seeing in a gross appearance and what you correlate uh, and what you see on the x-ray. So I will uh, let us turn over and focus now more on the uh, ankle and physial injuries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for uh, superb coverage of the tibial fractures on all, all the varieties. Uh, I think we will take audience questions at the end of both talks before we move to cases. So can I invite Dr. Sandeep Hemadi to share his uh, presentation on uh, the foot injuries? Uh, thank you, Sandeep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll share. Uh, 
can you see me now uh, no we no. can't see your screen okay just a minute Yeah, yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll try and get through um, this topic in as short time as possible. Uh, there, there are a few things we need to talk about. So essentially, I'd, I'd start off by saying that the majority of pediatric foot fractures do well with non-operative treatment. Um, just like any uh, good medical practice, you need to understand the anatomy, uh, have a good examination of your patients, <coughs> use your imaging, and in this group, have, have a high degree of suspicion. If your, your history and examination suggests that you've got an injury, but your imaging is, your initial imaging is not showing it, make sure you get the right imaging for it. Saying that, however, there's always a however, there are some fractures that have higher complication rates uh, than others and we'll go through them uh, as we go through this presentation. So the pediatric foot fractures, uh, this is the variation you have. Uh, you know, you can have a 12 month old child or you can have a 12 year old child. And really a lot of the pediatric foot and ankle fractures almost could be so grouped in the under six, the six to 12 and beyond 12 where they behave more like adults. So mechanism, um, you know, the mechanism injury may not always be known or the kid may not give it to you. Uh, we've got tarsal bones with large amount of uh, cartilage, so you might not see initial fractures easily on plain films. You've got to remember the position of the metatarsal physis. So two, three, four, the physis are distal, uh, and the first one, it's proximal. And then there are lots of accessory bones and apophysis that, that can confuse um, the diagnosis sometimes. So this is just uh, a picture showing all the various uh, accessory bones that can be found in the foot and ankle, the ostrigonum being the most uh, common of them. So foot fractures, they're about 10.5 per 10,000 children. They tend to be equal in boys and girls when you look at the entire spectrum, but in the older age group, there are more boys than girls. So they tend to be rare in infants and toddlers, uh, and their peak incidence is around 12 or 13. They represent about 10 to 13% of all fractures in children. Now of this entire group, 50% of these are in the phalanges and the metatarsals. That's the bulk in terms of numbers. So let's uh, start with them. Uh, right, so, you know, as with, with any fracture, you get a good history, uh, you see the mechanics of the injury, the forces involved, examination, uh, your neurovascular assessment, uh, you look in adults for stretch pain, but in, in pediatric population, we, we look for the three A's for the compartment syndrome. So anxiety, aggression, and increasing need for analgesia. And in the clinical examination, in, in a couple of situations, the, you know, looking for the soft tissue injuries, the plantar bruising can uh, point you in the right direction. We'll choose these as we discuss the uh, individual cases. So there's a whole spectrum of imaging available. So we've probably all heard of the CMOS fracture in the hand, uh, which is a sort of type one or two distal phalanx fracture, which is a, often associated with open injury and complications. But there is a similar injury, which is called the stub toe uh, in the foot, which was described by Pinckney in 1981. And despite it being described a while ago, it is still an injury which is often uh, not adequately appreciated or treated. So in a stub toe, uh, if you have a growth plate injury or a solitaris one or two, and there is any displacement uh, at that fracture site associated with either a uh, bleeding from the edge of the nail plate or a subungal hematoma, then you need to suspect this to be an open injury. Uh, if you look here in this picture, your growth plate is very close. There's a thin germinal matrix, a nail plate, and then the cuticle. So even if it displaces by more than 10 degrees, it's likely to break through here and become an open fracture. 
So if you see uh, bleeding or a subangle hematoma, check your x-rays. If there is a globe plate injury, it's probably an open fracture. Uh, standard treatment is, you know, early antibiotics, irrigation, debridement, reduce the fracture and stabilize it. Um, this is one way of dealing with it. If you had an unstable uh, fracture, uh, some of them are stable and you can splint them without the need for metal work. Uh, the reason to highlight this uh, fracture was that there's been a lot of publications for the open CMOS fractures where if you don't treat them, if you treat them adequately, you should have virtually zero rate of infection. But if you partially treat them or don't uh, treat them adequately, you can have quite high rates of, uh, of infection. Uh, going on to uh, first ray fractures, um, you can get most of these we manage uh, conservatively and we'll go on to get good results. So you can have little fractures at the base of the first around the neck of the first, or again at the base here, uh, they need you know, first aid, immobilization, uh, and then mobilize as comfort allows and normally go on to heal uneventfully. There are however, other first aid fractures, which are the intraarticular fractures, which have a much higher complication rate. So if you have an intraarticular fracture, either at the uh, first MTP joint or the distal IP joint, uh, when they involve more than 30% of the articular surface or have more than three millimeters of displacement, you need to consider <coughs> fixation. Um, there, are, there is literature to say that, you know, 10% of these tend to get post-traumatic arthritis. They have a high complication rate in terms of, despite you fixing them, they can get non-unions and stiffness and some complications with the implant itself. Now, moving Swiftly to the lesser metatarsal fractures. In my in my other practice, I am an adult foot and ankle surgeon. I spend a lot of my time maintaining the parabola and the lens of the metatarsals, both in the uh, you know maintaining the transverse arch and the longitudinal arch. Um, in adults, we adjust the lens of the metatarsals to prevent metatarsalgia. So, while in the younger patients who have uh, metatarsal fractures, uh, where there's you know, very good remodeling potential, you majority would be managed non-operatively. But if you look at the older children, those where the physis are starting to close, if you have multiple metatarsal injuries like this, then you've got to treat them very similarly as to what you would treat an adult foot uh, fracture. Uh, and therefore, if you restore their length and the alignment of the metatarsals, you will prevent metatarsalgia and create less work for your adult foot and ankle surgeon later. Um, Fifth metatarsal fractures, um, we could look at them in, in, in the various zones that they that they fall in. Uh, so zone one are your avulsion fractures, zone two are the ones that involve their articulation with the base of the fourth. Zone three is the Jones fracture, which we know tends to have a higher complication rate and non-union problems. And then you have the shaft and the neck and head. Now zone in one and one and two fractures are generally managed conservatively. The majority heal uneventfully, uh, and we'll go on to a bony union or sometimes an asymptomatic fibrous union. Similarly, the neck and shaft fractures are also, the majority is managed conservatively. It's the zone three Jones fracture that we, we need to look in uh, a little more detail. So here are the, um, you know, a, a neck fracture there. Um, even if you get a liberal displacement, it normally throws a lot of callus. A heel walking shoe or a walking air cast boot is sufficient. Fractures at the base of the fifth, uh, again, tend to heal uneventfully. Now, here's a, a fracture where you've got a prominent apophysis at the base of the fifth, which, is, which appears or is present somewhere between the age of nine and 12. And I'm just highlighting that to show you that this is the apophysis. That is the fracture line. And you can now look at that X-ray again. Most of the apophysis run in this plane and the fractures turn to run transversely. So uh, when looking at the base, the fifth metatarsis fractures, these which are defined as lying between 20 to 50 millimeters from the tip uh, of the base, the fifth metatarsis have a higher risk of non-union in the older child. Uh, and this is because we, you know, we believe that this is a watershed area for the blood supply and therefore they tend to get higher non-unions. 
the gold standard in, in the adult uh, literature and in, in young athletes is to treat these now with intermediary screws. Um, if I was going to give you some technical tips, if you, you were dealing with this, um, you need to use a solid screw. They, they have a better success rate than cameliated screws. Don't overfill the canal. When you, you need to get two good views to get this screw in. Remember the fifth metatarsus is quite a bored bone. So we normally use a guide wire. If, if you have an APV, you start very medial and in the oblique view, you start high. So the guide wire needs to start medial and high in the two planes. Uh, you decide the length of the screw after you've seen your wire on both views. Uh, normally in this age group, you're gonna use either a four or 4.5 millimeter screw. <laughs> Remember in your entry point, the sural nerve is very close. You need to make a large enough incision to get it out of the way and then uh, get your implant in. So this is just some pictures showing you the initial guide wire, uh, then you drill uh, and then you pass your screw through. Um, so as I said, this is, this is another gold standard for, for any elite athlete or where return to sport is important. Uh, when you're dealing with stress fractures of the fifth metatarsus, you need to assess for hind foot wearers. And if it is significant and fixed, it needs to be corrected. Uh, otherwise you will get a recurrence of these fractures. And similarly, when you're dealing with stress fractures, you need to correct any vitamin D deficiency. Um, moving to list frank injuries, these are your tarsal metatarsal uh, fracture dislocations, um, named after a French military surgeon. In the adult population, it, it, it forms about less than 1% of fractures. In children, it is rarer. Uh, but the peak age, again, is that 12, 13, when the physis are starting to close. So just to highlight the anatomy of the TMT joint, we tend to call it uh, a mortis joint because the, the base of the second metatarsus is, is keyed in, uh, it sits more proximal. And just to give you an idea of why it's called a mortis, I've, I've put a little ankle picture upside down there uh, to see if you can see the similarity. That would be your base of second, that would be medial cuneiform, this would be intermediate cuneiform and lateral cuneiform. So you have one, two, three articulate with the respective cuneiforms, four and five with the cuboid, and your list frank ligament runs from the medial cuneiform to the base of the second metatarsus. Now in your diagnosis, normally the history is significant. Uh, if you see uh, plantar bruising, midfoot tenderness, uh, then you should have a high index of suspicion for this injury because there would be some children where there may be a spontaneous reduction and, and your initial plane film may not show you uh, a significant um, uh, finding, but you need to have a high index of suspicion. If your story and your examinations, you suspect it, then get either weight bearing films or further imaging to confirm the diagnosis. Um, I tend to use a CT scan in this adolescent group and in my adult practice rather than an MRI scan to, to see the position and the fractures. Uh, even, uh, it, again, the, the gap between your first and second metatarsal base should be less than three millimeters. And then the gap between the base of second and medial cuneiform should be less than two millimeters. Uh, treatment, um, under 12, most are managed non-operatively. Uh, they're non-weight bearing in the baloney cast for somewhere between four to six weeks. Whether you allow weight bearing at week four or week six varies depending on the surgeon. Um, and, it, and here's a, a paper which said that about 66% had non-operative treatment, 34% had operative treatment, but this, in this 34, the majority were in the older group where the physis were almost closed. When, uh, if you cannot get, if you're going into operative management, then you're gonna attempt a closed reduction and then fixation with KYs or cannulated screws. If you cannot get a satisfactory closed reduction, then you would do an open reduction. Um, in adult practice, we almost always do an open uh, reduction to ensure that we've cleared that gap. And in, in kids, you can attempt to get, uh, you can try and get a good close reduction. So again, some, some technical tips. Uh, there are lots of books which will show you that you can use this incision to deal with the second TMT and the first TMT. My personal suggestion is you use an incision which is directed on the second metatarsis so you can get down to bone, get subperiosteal, 
and then dissect in this direction. So directly under this is your neurovascular bundle. If you use this incision, you'll have to isolate the neurovascular bundle and then keep moving it to one or side or the other, depending on whether you're dealing with the second DMT or the first. So when I, even if I have to deal with both joints, I prefer to use that incision than a second incision uh, on the medial side. So again, I can get straight to bone. And I don't have to dissect the neurovascular bundle. It's a lot quicker that way. Um, and then you fix uh, the a screw from the base of the second to the mural cuneiform. And if, as in this case, there's opening between the two cuneiforms, I put a screw across that as well. Um, okay, so list frank injuries, uh, complications. Um, when you can quote these rates, these rates, you, you have to appreciate that the number of cases out in the literature are very small. And so these percentages are really skewed by, uh, by by papers that have very small numbers. Anyway, this uh, uh, Willie's paper suggests that 22% had red residual pain. Uh, the most recent paper, which uh, showed 21% had residual displacement or malunion, and about 38% would get TMT joint arthrosis. Now, the base of the second is like a keystone in a in a Roman stone bridge. If that keystone is not put back in place, your transverse arch will collapse. And if your transverse arch collapses, then you'll get this acquired planovalgus deformity, which can be painful in addition to the midfoot arthrosis. One other thing that's changing in, in the adult um, uh, management is we're, we're going away from screws and we're tending to use more plates. It seems to make logical sense. We're trying to preserve these joints and then we, we drill through the cartilage with these screws. Um, it seems that in the long term, be more logical to use plates where you don't damage the articular surface. I'm moving on to uh, navicular fractures. Um, now, undisplaced navicular fractures uh, are managed uh, conservatively. Uh, this was uh, one of our patients that came in during the lockdown. We managed it with an air cast boot. This is about eight weeks down the line. It's a little bit slow to consolidate, but we'll, we'll persist with non-operative management. If you get a, a more displaced intarticular fracture, as in this particular case, uh, you would image it, check uh, the degree of displacement, number of fragments. We decided to, to fix this. Uh, this was a 12 or 13 year old girl. Uh, some tips, if you are going to fix these navicular fractures, then you need to use a little distractor called a Hinterman distractor. Uh, I use two millimeter K wires in the talus and the cuneiform. Uh, you jack the medial column out, the fragments go back in nicely, you hold it with temporary wire, and then I've used a locking plate to, to keep the, the fragment reduced. Um, that is there. Now, Taylor fractures. Um, they tend to form, depending on what literature you read, somewhere between 0.1 to up to 1% of pediatric fractures. They tend to be involving 2% of all pediatric foot fractures. And the reason we're discussing them is because they tend to have complications. Uh, the AVN rates vary. Some literature will say 0% and others say 66%. But if you look at all the literature that's out there, uh, you know, the numbers are really small. The biggest uh, case study here, we had 25 patients. And there was this paper in 1943, which only had three patients. <laughs> and that one single publication will give you an avascular rate of 66%, but you can't really use them meaningfully when, when the series has three patients in them. Uh, and similarly, the arthrosis rate is very skewed because of very small numbers in literature. Uh, classification is similar to your, your uh, adult uh, Taylor fracture dislocations. We tend to use the Hawkins system. Uh, you've got the undisplaced uh, involving the subtalar joint, involving the ankle joint, and the Taylor navicular and ankle joint. Uh, we know the vascularity of the talus is, is precarious, and you know that's well covered in adult literature. Um, the Hawkins sign, which we rely on so much in, in the adult uh, practice, uh, is not as reliable in children. Uh, it has, say, 100% sensitivity, but only 57% specificity. So some children who have an absence of the Hawkins sign may not have AVN, and clearly an MRI scan is, is better at um, 
diagnosing AVN and monitoring it than your just the Hawkins sign, which we use in adult practice. So undisplaced fractures less than the age 12 tend to manage them conservatively. Um, you can see them They Sometimes I have subtle signs. I've just magnified it that there for you. Uh, and they'll be managed in, you know, baloney um, casts for again, four to six weeks. Um, we're looking at some uh, other fractures you tend to get in adolescence. This is the snowboarder's fracture, which is a fracture of the lateral process of the talus. Um, often it can be missed and get diagnosed as an ankle sprain. Uh, once you've diagnosed it, you need a CT to assess the size of the fragment and the location. Small fragments we tend to excise, larger fragments you can put back with screws. Um, this is a Taylor body fracture in, in a young adult. Uh, that we, we imaged um, and we, it needed to be fixed because the ankle and the septal joint was uh, incongruent. Uh, we used a medial malleolar osteotomy in this patient uh, and we, we fixed it uh, from posterior medial to anterolateral with these screws. Now in, in the younger population, this is clearly not going to be an option. So here you've got a, a, a child with a tail and neck and body fracture. You'd get a CT scan to plan your, uh, your approach and fixation. Uh, this required a, and you know, had, was fixed with an anteromedial and an anterolateral approach to get the two screws. And then a posteromedial incision through the bed of tip post to reduce the body fragment with K wires. The K wires were subsequently removed and non-repairing six weeks and then protected weight bearing in ankle boot to union. Um, calcaneal fractures, um, they occur about, you know, they, they form 2% of the adult fractures, but in children, they're much rarer. Um, when present, 60% of them tend to be extra articular uh, and 20% are intra articular, but undisplaced. So it's only the small 20% that uh, may need intervention. Majority again are treated non-operatively. Uh, older patients, with severe displaced intraarticular fractures may need intervention. So here you have a, uh, an, an undisplaced extraarticular fracture and an undisplaced intraarticular fracture. Both can be managed conservatively. Uh, extraarticular fractures, this is just an adult uh, picture I've used here. If it involves the insertion of the Achilles tendon, then it does need fixation. Uh, these tend to have a uh, high implant failure rate and therefore in the post-op, rehab. Uh, I tend to keep them in an equinus cast, non weight bearing for zero to three weeks, then week three to six in an ankle boot with three wedges, and then sequentially bring it up uh, to neutral position. Uh, again, uh, from adult literature, we know the primary fracture line gives you a two-part fracture, posterolateral and tromedial. The secondary line will give you either a joint depression type or a tongue depression uh, or tongue type fracture. Um, this uh, X-ray was kindly provided to me by uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Sampath Tumre Patil, uh, and he managed this 12-year-old uh, male uh, with a limited um, lateral incision, um, limited open reduction, and fixation with wires. Uh, wires were subsequently removed, and just is an example of uh, a calcium fracture managed with limited open reduction. So. The other things that, that I need to point out, um, in the differential diagnosis, there are many other conditions in, in the pediatric foot and ankle that can mimic fractures. So you could see a bifid physis, which is a physiological variant, which may appear to be a fracture. You can have, see Freiburg's disease with some subchondral fractures here. An ostrigonum could be mistaken for, for an avulsion fracture. We saw this uh, base of fifth apophysis, and we need to remember that the vertical uh, lines tend to be apophysis. Fractures tend to have transverse uh, lines. An accessory in navicular, Kohler's disease, uh, where you get um, osteochondrosis of the navicular. And occasionally, even Sever's disease, where you have a, a fragmented apophysis, uh, with, can present with acute pain and incidental history of trauma and, and can uh, fuse things. So that was a, a run through, um, just to, to highlight. Uh, 
uh, there are some, while the vast majority of pediatric foot fractures do well with non-operative treatment, there will be some uh, that have a high complication rate. We need to be aware of these and then manage them appropriately. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't overrun. Um, any questions? Thank you. It Thanks, Sandeep. Uh, uh, Premal, if we... Yeah, so there is a question Sorry. for Sandeep. Uh, uh, so, um, so multiple petatarsal fracture, how many incision you will use? Uh, Sandeep, can you unshare, unshare your presentation? Sorry, uh, I'll do that now. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. So, in can you repeat that? Fractures, Sandeep, would you use... Yeah. Twins? Sorry, I can't hear you. So, uh, Sandeep, the question was that if you have multiple metatarsal fractures, how many incisions would you make or how would you approach those? Okay, so so just to, to start again, remember, even if you have multiple metatarsal fractures, uh, we've we've assumed that this is an old enough child that you're thinking of intervention, that the displacement is significant. Mm -hmm. And if it was similar to the one that uh, was in the presentation, then I tend to use two incisions. So I do two and three through one incision and then four and five through the other incision. And then, you know, I, we saw that interesting case, I think the calcaneus fracture where it was fixed with K-wires going up into the talus. Yes. So is there a reason to avoid fixation within the calcaneus, like just putting a small plate or maybe a screw and uh, versus going through another joint, like transapicular pins? So that, that was a, a case that a colleague of mine uh, from Pune actually shared. And uh, he, he did a minimal opening and fixed it with K-wires holding uh, into the into the talus. I think it, it you know, if you're using KYs and you, you haven't got a good enough hold uh, in that fragment, then if you pin it across, it's again, it's stability versus uh, putting smooth wires across the subtalar joint to hold hold the fracture is, is reasonable, I think, rather than putting a plate or, or any other implants. And uh, and Andy, that was a great talk on the on tibial fractures. Really enjoyed it. Um, you know, my question is that you had, you said that you had about 14% of uh, mild union more than 10 degrees when you looked at your elastic nailing. Do you think the same criteria that we use for the femur, uh, like, you know, 110 pounds, you know, 11 year cutoff age, uh, do you think those criteria we can use for tibia as well, uh, you know, to prevent a mild union or are there other factors like, you know, the, uh, the implant, uh, you know, uh, properties or, you know, titanium versus stainless steel? Can you just uh, elaborate a little bit on, on how, what do you think would be the cause of malunion? And that was one of the uh, original focuses of the, the study. And one of the things we wanted to look at, particularly weight of the child, BMI, um, canal fill. We spent a lot of time measuring those x-rays. And it was interesting, none of those things actually panned out. I thought they would matter more. And we had a big spectrum of patients, patient size, quality of reductions, um, implants. I mean, I just call it fill of the canal. And it, it didn't matter. As much as we tried spinning the data, we couldn't find that those things made a difference. So it really was the open fractures and the fractures associated with compartment syndrome that were the higher risk of having issues. And, and what the mild union is like afterwards, like you had a good x-ray that showed that it was adequate anatomically reduced and then in bed for mild union or they were not reduced right? So there's probably 30 surgeons or 25 surgeons that contributed patients to that series. So not, there was technical variation, let's be honest. Some of the post-op x-rays did not look as good as others. Uh, so some patients left the operating room with the malunion, um, but most of them drifted. Most of them looked pretty good. were within an acceptable range, and then they drifted over the next six weeks uh, for various reasons. Yeah, Dr. Slongo, you had a comment. Yeah, yeah, I, I have to make a comment about uh, these complications or problems in the in the tibia fractures. Uh, Andrew, I agree absolutely what you said before, but these are all questions about indications. But before we discuss this, we have to ask a question. Who is responsible for the treatment? And this is the surgeon. That means the wrong indication is not the patient. The wrong indication is the surgeon. 
the wrong technique, as I have seen in your uh, pictures that uh, you showed in the complication, is, uh, is the surgeon. That means every failure or complication has a face. This is the face of the surgeon. That, that the, uh, the start point is the surgeon itself. And again, coming back to your third slide when you are showing the, the complication rate, 43%. And in this picture, particular picture in the middle of your slide, we see the failure of the surgeon. That means in our OP technique, we say in the tibia, at the end, we have to orientate the tips, nail tips backwards to prevent a, this a malunion or cosmetical bad situation of the recuratum. But exactly this picture showed that the, the tips were in front. That means you, uh, that this surgeon, it's not you, this surgeon creates a, a malunion. So this a malunion is created by the surgeon himself. And I hate really in general, not only for elastic nail, I hate if we are looking always or saying always that the implant makes the failure. No, it's always the surgeon. It's always the surgeon. But, but isn't it true for any fractures? That's a great point. Is, isn't it, it true for any no, fractures? Like, it's you know. for every, every fracture because you as surgeon, you decide what to do. That means when you go with the wrong technique or wrong method and you fail, this is your indicational failure. That means it's a systematic failure. Actually, I wrote an article and will be published next month for a German journal, I gave a talk about ad hoc and systematic failures in surgery. And especially in pediatric trauma, skeletal trauma, 95% of all the failures or complications are systematic failures produced by the surgeon, missing wrong indication, body weight, age, everything, these factors, of course, about this. The, the surgeon has to consider all these effects. You agree? But then then the don't you think? Uh, don't you think that there may be implants which are more forgiving than a, than an elastic nail, where you have to be so exact yeah. and perfect all the time? Of for course, example, of course. Andy, Therefore, for example, I say Andy. always, the elastic nailing or the elastic nail is the only implant who forgives for failure of the surgeons. If you will make the same failure, perhaps with a high tech implant you will really end up in a disaster. But the so elastic nail forgives a lot for technical failures. And at the end, only to say, oh, look, why you criticize? Because it heals well. In the next situation, when you make the same failure again, you will fail, you know? I think, is, I think we'll, we should move on, Sheetal. We, yeah. we will be listening to Dr. Shlongo's oration uh, yeah, next right. Sunday. Sandeep, we uh, have some questions. Yeah, yeah you, if hour, you can just take questions to Dr. Penak quickly so that we'll move yeah. to ankle. Uh, could you elaborate about the interlocking nails in older kids in tibia? A few people are asking what are your indications and what age is the youngest to use uh, interlocking nails? It's, it's a great question. I think it's being worked out. The youngest, I believe, at our institution is about age 10, but obviously there's variation. There's 10 year olds that have already gone through, you know, puberty that have feces that are almost closing. There's 10 year olds that are prepubescent. Um, there's several implant companies now that are strategically designing nails with a smaller entry point into the proximal tibia. Most of the commercially available adult nails have a 13 millimeter uh, reamer. So several of the companies are now trying to get that down to more 10 millimeters to kind of closer match at eight millimeter rigid nail that would probably be selected. Uh, therefore, you're gonna minimize the amount of the surface area of the physis. Uh, but clearly there isn't, there aren't published studies on it yet and we need to look into it closer. But I think there is a movement in that direction. Um, hopefully, I'm guessing in the next few years we'll see several studies coming out on it, but that literature just doesn't exist yet. Can, can you just also elaborate indications for plating? I'm sorry, what was that? Indications for plating. Um, I think plating is, once again, I think uh, Dr. Slong's uh, comments are very appropriate that a lot of us don't have a ton of elastic nailing experience. You might do two or three a year, and is that enough to reproducibly do the surgery well 
you can argue that it's probably very much surgeon dependence. I think most orthopedic surgeons around the world are very comfortable putting a plate and screws on and can do it well, and it's reproducible uh, with relatively low risk. So I think the indications typically are a longer oblique fracture, um, especially an open fracture. If the wound's already open, you're staring at the fracture, there's not much additional morbidity for putting a plate and screws on. Um, so open fracture for me with a long oblique fracture pattern, I love putting two or three oblique um, leg screws and calling it a day. Uh, you almost never have to remove those screws. You get an anatomic reduction, you get primary bone healing. There's low rates of uh, wound complications. So I not infrequently when I have open fracture that's long oblique will play it or just screw. All right. There Thank is you. More of, last there question. Is more, more a demand for a solid nail also for the tibia. That's correct. But the only point you have to uh, consider is if you are using a solid nail through the growth plate in a younger patient, leave the nail in nearly up to the end of the growth because as long as the implant is like in a fascia dual case or a, a nail, as long as the implant is in the growth plate, you will never have a growth arrest. We know this from the osteogenesis. This is the only point that then leave the nail, otherwise you will have a big hole and then you will have a bridge. You agree, Andrew? Okay. I, I agree. I, I would leave it as long as possible, as long as it's not in to the joint. Okay. So that is uh, so Premal, my last the, question. Last question is that is there a proper technique of inserting ESI in a <laughs> fracture considering the triangular shape of the medullary cavity? I think there are some technical issues. I think uh, the point that was made earlier about having the tips of the nail at the distal end of the construct point posteriorly, I think will help prevent some of that recurvatum that you see. Um, the Atlanta group has also talked about double stacking nails. So in a big open canal that you can't fill 80%, you can actually put four uh, flexible nails in two C's from each side. Um, I, I don't think for a, most of these fractures are diaphyseal or distal on the tibia. So I don't think it's quite as important where the insertion is point is proximally, as long as you're distal to that physis. Um, I think more proximal fracture, you probably do need to consider that more, but that's pretty rare in pediatric patients. I can stimulate all the delegates to to follow my presentation next week. So, yes, come in. I think we are going to have a feast next uh, next week. Uh, Dr. Shlongo will be speaking on all kinds of problems and elaborate on elastic nails. So uh, I guess we'll move on to ankle fractures. Yeah, let me just uh, ask Andy one question. Is there a way that you, uh, you can prevent the cosine phenomenon? Like what do you do to prevent it? So we talk about a lot of times there's a residual valgus deformity. Um, is it worth putting a child to sleep to do a conscious sedation that always becomes the issue? I think if you can push the initial deformity out so they're not starting valgus, and then once you get them to heal, I don't think there's much that you can do. I mean, I think it's the same as what Aronson showed with cutting the periosteum in horses, that it just, it occurs in some of these. So uh, maybe other... Um, the delegates here have input on how to prevent it beyond just getting an anatomic reduction out of the gates, but I don't have any suggestions. And we put a uh, we put a various mold on all these fractures, make sure that there is no gap, make sure that they are not aligned in a little bit of valgus, which all of them, you know, pretty much if you critically analyze it, you may see initially there was mild gap. So we, we kind of tend to over reduce, not even anatomically reduce it and put them in a little bit of various in that age group, just thinking that, you know, you may not be able to uh, over reduce actually if it's a small fracture, but giving a very just, small. You, you just, oh. Okay. So can we move on, Cheetal? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I think we'll move on to the cases. Uh, the first, uh, again, is a quiz. Uh, Sandeep Vaidya, if you can just take over. Yeah. So this was. Uh... Uh, another adolescent boy who presented with a history of, uh, you know, twisting injury to the ankle. And we will start off with the quiz. So, uh, 
according to the Takjian Diaz classification, which is used for classification of distal tibia fractures in children, what kind of injury would this uh, uh, be classified as? So, uh, Ashok, can you start the poll? It started already. Okay, so uh, I can see that 87% uh, people have identified it as a pronation external rotation injury. Is that right, Sandeep? Yeah, absolutely. So 87% uh, of the okay. have got it right. And the clues to uh, you know identifying the injury are that the metaphyseal beak is on the lateral side and the fibula fracture is at a higher level as compared to the uh, tibia fracture. So this is a pronation external rotation injury. Uh, now, okay, okay. So, yeah. So, we attempted a closed reduction by uh, giving internal rotation, by performing internal rotation and holding the ankle in a, a, a position of supination. Because, as we know, the Tagjian classification, uh, DS classification, uh, gives us the, uh, the uh, we have to reverse the mechanism of injury and hold the foot in the reverse direction. However, this is the you know the picture that we obtained at the end of our close reduction, and we could not get any better than this. So, uh, so the key over here to, is understanding is that we cannot accept the gap which exists on the medial side, because the presence of this gap indicates that probably there is an entrapment of soft tissue within the gap. Uh, in many instances, this gap can be an interposed periosteum or it can be, you know, interposed soft tissues, which can be tendons or in some cases, even neurovascular bundles. So it has to be appreciated that this gap can never be accepted. In case of interposed periosteum, if we, you know, allow that gap to persist, then it can lead to a facial uh, bar formation and growth arrest uh, uh, once this fracture heals. So it is important that this, uh, you know, this fracture be reduced. Can we go to the next slide? So that is what we did. What we did was that we opened up on the medial side. You can see the incision on the medial side, and we retracted the periosteal flaps. Uh, we we uh, you know extracted the periosteal flaps which were entrapped in the on the medial side, and additionally we fixed up the fibula fracture and the uh, the the the, uh, the tibia fracture. We fixed with a single screw which went from the Thurston Holland fragment from the anterolateral aspect to the posterior medial aspect. Okay, so I'll just stop here. We have Professor K. Wilkins with us. So, Dr. Wilkins, we are happy that you are here with us and all of us are still uh, using a lot of your slides too. So, would you always fix the fibula for this kind of a fracture? Yeah, my, my experience is that, just like he says, the most common thing is that the see interposed periosteum. And if you see it, it needs to be removed. One of the things everybody is concerned that if you leave it there, you'll get you'll get growth arrest. But actually what you get is you get growth overgrowth. It has a tendency to stimulate growth on the medial side and the big complication is usually they get into a valgus angulation. But uh, I think the important thing is that you always look for periosteal elevation. And I think when we talk to the next type is if it's plantar flexion injury, you also have the same complication there. But that's okay. Peter, very, very uh, appreciated. Yeah, Sheetal, you wanted to say something? Yeah, so, you know, you, you got to differentiate between, uh, uh, you know, a uh, soft tissue interposition like a tendon neurovascular versus periosteal mm -hmm. interposition. If you have periosteal interposition, you will see the gap on the physis, but you would still be able to get the alignment. You know, we had, a, we had three cases where we had posterior tibialis tendon entrapment at the fracture site, and all of them, we could not reduce it at all. But if you could reduce it and you just have a gap at the physis, then it's most likely periosteum. Now, whether you can take out the periosteum or you don't have to take out, it's a controversial because, and Andy can, Andy can comment because they had conflicting papers. You know, the first paper said, take it out. And the second paper said, don't take it out because the growth arrest rates are the same. So I would let him comment on it, but I would like to differentiate the periosteal entrapment from a tendon interposition, which you would not be able to reduce a fracture at all. It's like bowstringing across the metaphysis and you'll have to 
but Lord Fonlar has shown very, very nicely. Dependent. But that for the periosteum, yeah. Andy, what, what are you? Sorry, go ahead, Dr. Slongo. Lutz von Lahr has shown a long time ago, 30 years ago, uh, this is the same in the proximal tibia, the same discussion as here, that if you bring this uh, medial part under compression, even in a, a cast or perhaps with a, a reduction and the Kirchner wire, it, it will, uh, this will heal and the periosteum is not the issue. But my okay. point here is, there is in, uh, in the meantime in pediatric trauma, nearly an agreement that in pediatrics, Fibula osteosynthesis is absolutely obsolete. I guess this is a nonsense. And we should advocate that nobody is doing this in this way, especially for what? You know, this is definitely not necessary. Uh, Andy, you have any comments on the interposition, periosteal interposition? We would, yeah. would you remove or not remove? So um, in 2003, my senior partner, Dr. Mubarak, published a, a pretty good sized series looking at these physeal injuries, Salter Harris II fractures with interposed periosteum. And what they found was that when you had a residual gap after the reduction, three millimeters or greater, the vast majority of those went on to a premature physeal closure. The ones that had a residual gap less than three millimeters, so two millimeters or less, had a much lower rate of premature physio closure. So based on that, they really recommended surgically going in and removing the periosteum on all of these cases. Whether or not you need to put smooth K-wires across the physis, a screw in the Thurston Holland fragment or nothing, the point was more you need to get the periosteum out to reduce, uh, to not only reduce the fracture, but more importantly, to prevent a closure or minimize the closure. So then we went back and looked at about eight more years of data, maybe it was 10 more years of data to see if we were making a difference. And interestingly, we looked at that same cohort. We found that our surgery was really not lessening the odds of closure, that the damage is probably done at the time of the injury and that going in surgically removing periosteum does not seem to change the natural history. So for the most part as an institution, we've now stopped operating on these as long as the reduction is adequate. If it's within five degrees, varus valgus, procrevatum, recrevatum, we accept it. Um, but certainly even Dr. Mubarak still thinks there's more that we can do that maybe we should be prophylactically fat grafting or some other considerations to lessen the odds of a closure. But I think the reality is our surgery isn't changing um, the odds that this fracture will close. So that, that's a valuable uh, message, I guess, that every periosteal interposition need not be removed unless it's really blocking reduction or causing a deformation which is not getting corrected. And it's not mandatory to fix the fibula, as is shown here, that it can go on to a satisfactory healing. Okay, so let's move on to the next kind of a fracture. Again, Ashok, can you run the poll? This is the injury. Uh, now, would you do a close reduction and a cast or a close reduction with a K wire or a close reduction with a cannulated screw or an open reduction and tension band wiring? The question is really, uh, we have a lot of adult orthopedic surgeons here who are doing pediatric trauma and as a fallout of their adult work, they do end up putting KYs and doing tension band wiring. So we would like to see how the response is. I'll, I'll go with the fifth option here, yes. Sandeep. Yeah. Our program. And... No, I mean, I, I mean, I don't mind, you know, closing and opening. I don't think, uh, you know, it should matter here as long as you get an anatomic reduction. But the anatomic fixation, reduction. Yeah, fixation would be a, a candidate okay. too, you know, uh, or okay. unless. It, you know, so I, I open but reduction it, it, and a screw probably is a good choice. Uh, you know, okay. obviously not okay. a tension band wiring. That is that has to okay. be a method. So, so we have six percent response open reduction with tension band wiring, which is again why we run the, the poll that this is certainly not to be done. Close reduction with cannulated screw, forty-seven percent. Close reduction and K wire, thirty-six percent. At the cast, eleven percent. So uh, let's see what happened with this uh, uh, particular patient. So uh, any comment, Sheetal, now on this reduction and K-wire and cast? 
Yeah, so you know the 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 main thing is anatomic reduction. It doesn't matter whether it's closed or open. There is no difference whether yes. it's open or closed. So would you accept this? No, this is a there is a step off. I would not accept. You know, not just a step off on the articular surface, but you're increasing the risk of having a growth arrest by not align aligning your physis. So both have problems here, and it's not an anatomic reduction. Okay, so this is not an acceptable situation at all, and this wire was left in for about six months. Yeah. So this is what happens, and this is a message that this is something that should not be done. So please be aware that the facial reduction and the articular reduction both are important, and don't if you pass in pins, they have to be out in three to four weeks because the fracture gums up by then. And there's no reason to leave in a wire for this long. So this is an example of a nine-year-old boy. Yeah, the medial malleolus fracture has the highest growth arrest rate rate when it comes to ankle fractures. Number one, and yes. so it's really important that you treat it right. Fix anatomy fixation decreases the rate of growth arrest by about I would say thirty to forty percent. Yes, you still cannot alter the entire natural history, but it's important to get it right. Anatomic fixation. And then you can decrease the growth arrest rate. So I would not accept a close reduction and a cast because you are not fixing it. And I would not accept, you know, uh, absolutely anything trans uh, transficial like a tension bend wiring. Absolutely. So that is what Dr. Wilkins had taught us long, long way back in 2001: the supination inversion injury, where the medial malleolar fracture is usually a type four injury, where it's a crushing injury with a vertical shearing force. With uh, a type one fibular facial injury, so if you are doing the percutaneous method, it's important that you do an arthrogram and confirm that your reduction is adequate when you do your reduction. And I chose to fix this with a transverse cannulated cancellous screw, making sure that my arthrogram confirmed that the articular congruity was uh, quite good. And then you stress the fibula and see if the fibula is stable. You just give a cast, which I did here. and the whole procedure could be com completed with a single stitch but as sheetal has pointed out quite rightly it's not the small incision which is important it's the accuracy of reduction and the transverse screw which is important this is again professor wilkins slides which he has kindly given us what about the fibula does it need fixation so you test it after you do the transverse screw and if it is usually stable it doesn't need fixation and that is how it should be fixed so any any comments andrew no i think um i, I agree with it's it's only a 2 cm incision i mean i have a low threshold for looking at the joint directly getting it anatomic i like the trans epiphyseal screw um there is controversy on whether or not you need to remove that screw there's some biomechanical data showing that it can alter the mechanics of the articular cartilage underneath it that's controversial um but uh, i think that is a consideration as well all right okay so i guess we'll just move on um so you have a third situation where you have a spiral fracture so molin can you just uh, if you can tell us more about a spiral fracture so uh So do, do we have lateral view, Sandeep, or just periphery view? So usually it's a. Um, yeah, so usually it's. So an, these uh, are supination external and, rotation patterns. External rotation. Yeah. yeah. Supination external rotation. So where you get a spiral? Yeah, uh, Professor Wilkins, if you can just highlight uh, the supination external rotation injury. Well, I think the most important thing of this is the rotational part, and that's that's something that you always make sure that when you get your reduction, that you have uh, completed and that you have corrected the rotational component of it. Um, and that's, I think, the most important thing. And here is just the opposite of the adults: is that the uh, tibia fails first, then the fibula fails. and here you can see that there is a rotational component of the fibula as well and once you get that that you realize that there probably is a lot more displacement or soft tissue injury because you have have a, a really a lot of displacement of the tibia before the forces is applied to the fibula so 
I think that's one of the things here you can see you don't before you do it you don't have a reduction you don't have an anatomic reduction of the distal tibia and that's the important thing that you need to get is that you need to do it with a rotation and that's this is the pre-op view and here again of course you can see the typical clinical picture where you have an external rotation and sometimes people focus on the fact that they have a oblique fracture or spiral fracture of the fibula and fail to recognize that actually there is a rotational fracture of the tibia. So I think that that's the important thing is the rotational component. And you need to make sure like you see here, look at it clinically that you completely corrected the amount of rotation. So, so a couple of messages there. One is Pay attention to the clinical picture. If your foot is lying in external rotation with a spiral fracture of the fibula, you might be having a distal tibial facial separation or a type 1 Salter injury to distal tibia. And it's important to analyze and judge that because otherwise you're going to end up with problems. So a, a rotational component has to be treated by derotation maneuver so that it closes nicely. And if required, you can put screws. So that was the third pattern of ankle injury. Uh, so uh, Sandeep, is Sandeep White? Sandeep, can you go back uh, of two slides? I would just point out to the on this yeah. X-ray. Sometimes you can get a triplane. Just go next, next X-ray, next slide. Okay. Yeah. And you see that there is an intraarticular fracture line here. You see that there is an intraarticular yes. fracture. So that's, that is not your typical supination external rotation fracture. This is a complex fracture with extension into the physis. So one should not miss it because this is like a triplane fracture. So if you have an intraarticular fracture, you probably, if you, are, if you think it's undisplaced, a CT scan may show you the real displacement, but if it's more than two millimeter displaced, you should fix this part of the fracture. I'm not really concerned about the metaphyseal part. You would be able to get it reduced but the intra-articular part, I would recommend fixing it. Absolutely. So we will come to the triplane injury. The fourth pattern that uh, the Log Hansen classification tells us is the plantar flexion injury, where you have the injury in equinus and the supination plantar flexion injury where there is posterior translation. So again, what is important here is to give exaggerate the deformity and pull the distal fragment anteriorly so that you get your reduction. So these fractures again have to be treated by reversing the translocation and bringing it into the correct position. The trick is flex the knee so that the gastrocnemius is relaxed and with your hand on the shin, you're pushing it back and you exaggerate the deformity and milk it like the lower radius metaphyseal fracture. And if it is unstable, you put a couple of cancellous screws there in the metaphysis, or if there is a lot of swelling, but otherwise you can treat it with a cast. So uh, Sandeep Vaidya, again, can you just now move on to the next quiz, Ashok? Yeah. So this is again an adolescent injury, and we can see that there is a twisting injury to the ankle. So how would you classify this injury according to the Salter-Harris classification? Okay, so 60% people feel it's a Salter Harris type 3. Would you agree, Sandeep? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's spot on. Uh, so, this is a you know, Salter Harris type 3 fracture of the anterolateral aspect of the distal tibial epiphysis. And the eponym given to this fracture is the Tilo fracture, named after this uh, French surgeon and anatomist who has multiple, uh, made multiple contributions apart from orthopedics. Next one. So uh, the Tilo fracture, actually, it is an avulsion of the tibial attachment of the anterior distal tibiofibular ligament. So this ligament, which inserts into the tibial epiphysis, it pulls apart the, uh, the anterolateral uh, part of the distal tibial epiphysis. And the mechanism of injury is it is an external rotation injury. 
it is a type of a transitional fracture that means it happens uh, sometime in uh, during the closure of the distal tibial uh, physis the distal tibial physis closure it begins centrally then goes medially and finally uh, the lateral epiphysis closes so it is somewhere in between the initiation and completion of closure that these trans transitional fractures occur and therefore they are so called as transitional fractures next please so again the key over here if you are uh, a close reduction uh, maneuver consists of internal rotation of the of the uh, distal fragment by a uh, uh, direct pressure on the anterolateral epiphysis now this close reduction maneuver may be aided by inserting an k wire into the fractured fragment the k wire with the k wire we then joystick the fracture uh, we rotate it internally get it into the proper alignment and the same k wire can then be advanced uh, uh, which will then serve as the guide wire for your screw so the trajectory for the screw insertion is again from the anterior lateral aspect to the posterior medial aspect within the epiphysis and uh, this is how these fractures are fixed in case a close reduction is not possible then you may go ahead with an open reduction but uh, since again these are intraarticular fractures getting an accurate reduction is important and uh, so that's the key to getting a good result in these fractures additionally one thing about the transitional fractures is since they are close to skeletal maturity uh, uh, the, the the premature closure of the physis or a growth arrest is not much of a concern in these fractures in the transitional fractures right so it's important to note that these are intraarticular and have to be fixed because they are intraarticular accurately the physial closure really doesn't matter they are already on their way to complete closure so let's let's move on to this is your patient so yes, can we have a sandeep yeah, i just so make one, here? one point here one yeah. you know, fracture sure. is that you know um, yeah again just like sure. the medial valvulus sure. fracture an anatomic reduction is what you need for this because this is an articular fracture as well as a physial fracture so i don't mind making a small opening if needed it has to be anatomic reduction so you know if you if you're not really convinced about your close reduction techniques it's it's better to just open it a little bit and fix it the fixation Absolutely. is good it, it needs to be the same type whether you come from you know medial or lateral that means for a medial malleolus you would do a similar type of a fixation and you do the same thing for a tilo fracture is an epiphysis screw but i think opening it would be a would not be a bad choice here to get an anatomic reduction there are two aspects so just just to add to so that i think one is identifying the fracture because a lot of time it is missed yeah sandeep go ahead sorry no, no. Yeah, that's just to, to continue what sheetal said if you're going to do an open reduction you in this particular fracture it's your intraarticular reduction which is important so your skin incision needs to be uh, where on the ct the the fragments medial edges so you know if if on that ct the medial edge is around Six o'clock or five o'clock. That's where you need to make the incision. Get into the joint. Get the surface reduced. You can then put the screw through a percutaneous incision. You don't have to put the screw through the same incision that you use to reduce the fracture. That's all. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Great point. So, so placement of incision is for reduction, not not for passage of screw. Exactly. Right. Okay. Let's let's move on to Maulin's case. Maulin, uh, you want to so, talk about this? Yeah, so this 12 year old girl who uh, fell from bicycle and presented with this sort of x-ray and uh, the first question so ashok can you have the quiz here so apparently it looks very uh, undisplaced kind, kind of injury can we conserve it or we need to fix it Okay, or, so ninety-two percent want to fix it, Maulin. Or I think the wise people would say we want to have another uh, option that we would like to image it first and then make our decision. So uh, that would be also a valid option, you know, uh, because it's it's a as we go on to see the CT scan images, there's not a simple uh, fracture, but it's a uh, triplane fracture. Now there's a nice paper from Sheetal and their colleagues in publishing JBJS twenty fifteen. 
and they uh, mentioned the role of CT scan into uh, pediatric triplane fracture. In 46% of patients, uh, when they got CT scan, the, there was change in the fracture pattern. In 39% of patients, uh, the displacement changed from less than 2 millimeters to more than 2 millimeters, so they have to uh, fix it. And in 20%, uh, 27%, they changed their plan from non-operative to the operative treatment. And in 40%, there was change in, of the screw numbers and configuration. So it's a very important paper for all the delegates to understand the role of CT scan, uh, not only to confirm the diagnosis, but also to understand the morphology of fracture and how you would fix it. And CT scan would help us in uh, differentiating from a two-part, two or three-part, or a four-part triplane fracture. And accordingly, we can make uh, our surgical uh, uh, decisions. So uh, can we go ahead, Sandeep? So if for a two-part triplane fracture, uh, we can just fix it, uh, reduce it, and fix it with a single screw starting from uh, 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 anterolateral to the postromedial, and it will fix the uh, fragments nicely. But the similar looking fracture, so here sometimes we, we do the supination maneuver internal rotation and we can reduce. Sometimes if it is not, we can put two guide wires, uh, two K wires and, and reduce it by turning as a joystick. And then you put one wire uh, and you fix it with a screw. Most of the times I have seen that uh, this can be fixed uh, with a simple reduction maneuver and you may not need guide wires. So, this so, is so the important part here is that the guide wires are in the epiphysis and yes. the maneuver of the guide wire also closes the metaphysis. Yes. yes. But and the then, trajectory of the screws is different. It's medial-lateral yes. in the epiphysis and anteroposterior in the metaphysis. Exactly. So that is what the delegates need to remember. So this is how it was fixed. It's a transverse epiphyseal uh, screw from lateral to medial. And the metaphyseal screws are in the frontal plane from anterior to posterior to fix the posterior metaphyseal fragment. We can check, uh, do an arthrogram to confirm the articular conduit as they have done in this case. Now, if we see that there are three part fracture, like the, uh, the pillow fragment and the metaphyseal posterior fragment, then we need to put two screws. The pillow fragment is fixed with an uh, anterolateral to the posteromedial, and the metaphyseal fragment should be fixed from the anteroposterior metaphyseal screw. So uh, this is how it was fixed. And so the CT scan uh, is a very important uh, uh, part uh, to decide what pattern of fracture it is, and we should uh, consider our fracture fixation uh, decision based on that. So, Sheetal, any comments about uh, triplane fractures? Uh, so, yeah, a couple of things. You know, one is that uh, uh, on the X-ray there was enough displacement that probably CT would I would not use CT to make my decision, but I would get a CT to plan my surgery to look at the fragments and to plan how the trajectory of the screws are going to be. One a few com few comments about you know reduction and surgery. Um, I've not found the use of the joysticking and you know, as required, you know, once you do the reduction maneuver. Uh, sometimes if you need compression, you can put a pointed uh, reduction clamp, uh, you know, percutaneously to compress uh, the fragment. And then you can uh, put your uh, yeah, wire, K wire in for your epiphyseal screw. And once, you know, if you can decide this based on the CT scan, but it's common that once you put your uh, lateral screw for the tilo fracture, it just starts maybe about three, four millimeters anterior to the fibula. So if you can, uh, if you can palpate the anterior edge of fibula, put your K-wire in, then your metaphyseal screw is frequently perpendicular to your epiphyseal screw. So even if you don't know exactly where the fragments are, because you have not opened it, <laughs> based on the CT scan, you can put your first screw, which is the epiphyseal screw for the telo part of it. And then for the metaphyseal part, you put a screw, uh, put a K-wire perpendicular to your first K-wire. And you know you can confirm that pre-op based on a CT scan how the trajectory should be, but that makes it really easy then to put your screws in because you've got the wires in the right position. So those right. are just tips, uh, you know, how to how to do a percutaneous reduction fixation. Right. 
संदीप एनी एडिशनल कमेंट्स और एंड्रू फॉर ट्रांजिशनल फ्रैक्चर्स जस्ट कमेंट यू नो द द स्लाइड दैट मॉलिन शोड द द सीटी स्कैन व्हिच इज जस्ट अबव द टेलर डोम इज इज द वन व्हिच इज इजीएस्ट टू प्लान द एपिफिशियल स्क्रू um yeah. and then normally the lateral sagittal one helps you plan the metaphyseal screw that's all you okay. probably okay. have to have a cannulated screw for the epiphyses but probably on the metaphyses you could get away without one okay so one Malin. question for uh, sheetal and uh, sandeep do you use your pre operative imaging in inversion because there there are sometimes the tilo fractures which are very minimally displaced so we can come to know that in the inversion can be conserve those fractures if at all there is because not all tilo fractures need fixation uh, so is there the recommendation for your patients you use no if it is displaced like more than 2 mm even though it could be reduced i would still fix it you know okay. uh, the reason is that the non union rate of a tilo fragment that is not treated not fixed is i think we have seen it and i think it's higher so uh it doesn't have a good uh, you know healing rate unless you fix it because it's intraarticular so if it's more than 2 mm i would not go with a close reduction i would do close reduction and fixation so okay. andy do you have any uh, any yeah, uh, points so we are just taking uh, sorry go on. dr uh, swill and i recently looked back at our post reduction ct scans cuz typically what we do they hit the door we reduce them closed we get a ct and then determine how much displacement there is if the joint is off we fix them if it's acceptable then we let it ride but we there's a group of our our staff that when they're displaced 2 to 4 mm not stepped off but gapped where they were treated non operatively so we went back and we now have the 5 year data on these their outcome data and it it looks like there's a cut off that if the displacement originally is more than 3 mm not surprisingly they have worse outcomes 4 to 5 years down the road more pain and more issues interestingly that 2 to 3 mm group didn't seem they did equivalent whether it should non operatively operatively and once again that's not a step up that's a gap so i i kind of maybe 3 mm but once again i'm not going to quibble about a millimeter here or there but i think somewhere around 3 mm they're for sure getting surgery in my practice okay molin um, i i have a comment to make See these yeah. are transitional fractures okay and we are looking at this as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon the equivalent of this that i see in my adult practice is a sprain of the aitfl so as the transition moves and your your growth plate is fusing that fragment will become smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually it will become a flake where aitfl comes off so it's more to do with the size of that fragment at some point in this transition it will become an adult injury and it will just be an aitfl sprain okay yeah that's a great point so i think uh, it's important what we have learned is that the log hansen equivalent of a pediatric uh, ankle injury depends on uh, position of the foot whether it is supinated or pronated and the direction of force is it adducted abducted or externally rotated and rotation is a very important component so you must remember as all people who are treating ankle injuries in children there are four patterns one is the supination inversion where you have the highest rate of complications because the medial malleolar fragment is a salter harris 4 it's a vertical shear crushing injury and it needs to be fixed with a intraepiphyseal screw the second is the pronation inversion extension rotation where the problem is interposition if you do not get an adequate reduction you are looking at a tip post getting entrapped if there's a medial gap probably it's periosteal entrapment it's controversial whether you need to remove that periosteal interposition as andrew has showed us that uh, long term results haven't showed any difference in growth or straights the third pattern is the external rotation injury where you have spiral fractures and if you see an isolated fibular spiral fracture be aware that there could be a tibial distal facial separation which may be open or there may be a posterior vertical component converting that into a triplane fracture so as sheetal pointed out a ct scan might be mandatory then there is the plantar flexion injury which needs a translational maneuver to reduce it so these are the four common patterns and then you have the special adolescent fractures which are the triplane and the tilo fractures which are transitional injuries but both are intraarticular both need accurate reduction and probably ct scans 
will help you change your decision about operative or non operative management so let's go back to that earlier ankle injury before we finish the session so i want op opinions from everyone how we are going to tackle this issue so andrew what do we do about this ankle now what is, is about uh, 11 years he has another so Go i ahead. i'll just yeah he's is he is about 11 years old and do you mention the uh, mri one more time i think there's some important points to be learned there yes 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 so yeah. you get a sense of how large that uh um the bar is one thing i've learned from looking and doing a lot of sports procedures is if you look at that physis it's a thin black line so that physis is not growing anymore um whereas the fibula you see it's kind of got this black white black and we call it the oreo sign it's like the oreo cookie so a very disparate view of the two physis so this physis is not going to grow even laterally on the tibia So clearly you need an osteotomy. I'm going to do an open opening wedge osteotomy and I would close that fibular physis at the same time and then you got to decide how much growth you think they have left and how much of a leg length discrepancy they have. Do you need to do anything on the other side to close the other leg? But I would do opening wedge osteotomy and a pifidesis of the fibula and I don't even think you need to worry about that anterior lateral um tibia because it's in essence it's not growing anymore even though it looks a little open there's no functional growth okay sandeep any 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 different plans now i i would shut the uh, distal fibula and stop the deformity getting any worse uh i would probably look at uh you know look at that imaging and a cross section and try and work out what surface area of that bar is if the, it's getting anywhere close to 40 or 50 then um i would do a supramalleolar corrective osteotomy and shorten the fibula okay sheetal you know the closing of the fibula and osteotomy are are going to be required for this patient so i i don't have any i mean there is no question about it because of the amount of deformity and the white growth plate the the issue is whether anyone would attempt to take down the bar or uh, the facial arrest thing okay. you know, so you can combine that with yeah. the osteotomy but my 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 feeling is that i would not attempt a facial resection or the bar resection here just because the bar is going to be bigger than what it looks on the x-ray like it's going to be a linear bar going all the way across and it's way the the success rate of taking down a medial medullus bar around that hump is pretty low so all right okay so, so any, any, any comment if you had yeah. somebody who had the skills to use a circular frame they would definitely put uh you know wondering in the epiphysis and they would just stretch it out and and put an hinge and open it up okay okay so i'll just go ahead with uh, to show you what i did i went with a osteotomy of the supramalleolar region but i went ahead and resected that bar from the medial side and i did shut down i went, i made that osteotomy so low that i went into the lateral part here and i resected a centimeter of the fibula actually extra facial so i went above the physis and resected that fibula and then i removed the bar which which i thought he has he has another 3 to 4 years minimum growth remaining so i burned that area put in a fat graft and the metaphyseal area which i opened i just put the fibular strut which i removed from this side on the medial side to keep the ankle mortise open but when i fixed the fibula with shortening i made sure i crossed the facial plate so that i shut this down but i did not drill it i just kept it like an epiphyseal disease plate uh, i did not uh, damage or uh, burn that uh, epiphysis here and that was the sort of alignment and correction that i could achieve and that's uh, the x ray over a period of time he he nicely the fat graft where i put did not show any evidence of closure there though the column healed very well this continued to grow a little bit this stopped and uh, actually he went on to a reasonably good function and this is how he is today so this is what we did for him so i don't know whether the facial bar resection uh, actually helped in any way uh, or it was only the osteotomy and the fibula did stop growing uh, without doing an epiphysodesis formally so any comments here cheetal 
No, I think that, uh, you know, osteotomy and closing the fibula were the right thing to do. And, you know, as uh, Andrew was mentioning, I don't know whether, you know, there was enough uh, growth left in the tibia anyways to start with. But, uh, the, I mean, you know, uh, th this is what I would have done. Uh, maybe the technique may have been different, but the goals would have been the same. So I think, Sandeep, that's good. You you restored the, the joint line and, you know, the joint line is horizontal and your mortise is looking good. So, like, right. okay. fibula, even after resection of fibula, your fibula is a little, little lower down here. So, fibula resection yeah. was a good idea, I think. Yes. I think if the tibia wasn't going to okay. grow, then you already had a long fibula, so you would have had to mm -hmm. show. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think uh, this is the last case and we've had a really long evening uh, talking about fracture neck femur, foot and ankle injuries, tibia fractures, ankle injuries. And uh, I'm really, really grateful and thankful that we had such a large galaxy of panelists who were there till the end patiently. Sheetal, I would like you to make some closing comments for the delegates before yeah, Taral uh, thanks everyone and we sign off. Yeah, yeah. I just have one quick question for Sandeep. You know, uh, we didn't have time to do too many foot and ankle questions, but you know, I just wanted a question about list strength. Uh, you know, on in kids. Uh, so, uh, what is your experience like in very younger patients where you can't evaluate? You know, because some of the uh, uh, bone is cartilaginous at the base, and so the reduction is sometimes difficult to evaluate. You know, my ex my personal experience has been that you know initially I used the techniques that you showed using K wires or candidate screws and did a close reduction. But when I ended up opening it or when I followed up these patients, I saw that, you know, my reduction probably wasn't as good as I thought. And so, you know, in the last, you know, few years I've changed to open reduction, like just making small incisions. And I'm surprised as to, you know, I can get it more anatomic than what I think I could by using close methods in, in children. So uh, one, it's, you know, it's rare. So I want to know what your experience is, like how young of a patient, uh, you know, to treat for this strength. And the second is, are there any tips of getting anatomic reduction for this strength injuries? Tithal, you know, you're going to attempt an open reduction in the older age group when you were coming close to closure. We're not talking about under six here. We're talking about, you know, more so sort of 10 to 12. Um, there is no other trick to, to get, to get uh, an accurate reduction. You have to open that mortise. You have to clear. There's always some bits in there, some osteochondral fragments. Sometimes there is... Uh, so unless you physically remove it and you see the cartilage touching each other, there's no other way of checking. Now, having done lots of open ones, you can see that you put the cartilage in exactly the right place in the mortise and you temporary head with the wire. But when you then use the image intensifier, you will see, you might still see what appears like a larger gap. Now, the gap is variable in different children and you often need to have a picture of the opposite leg before you start. So you know how much you're you're trying to you know, close it, especially in the closed reduction. In the open, you know, you've seen the cartilage in the right place and then you fix it. Uh, but for closed, I haven't got any tips. If you're not certain when you're doing it closed and in the older child, then it's better to open it like in an adult situation, look at it and place it back in. Thank you. I think, I think that these were great sessions. I think Andy just probably logged off, but, uh, you know, uh, it, Great uh, talks by uh, by Salil, uh, Sandeep, and uh, and Andy. So I really appreciate. I think the important message is, uh, you know, tibia uh, nailing. Uh, I think uh, it's really important uh, to uh, to look at the alignment, the the criteria for accepting tibial uh, reductions are a little bit more stringent compared to femur. So because femur femur has a higher, you know, bigger soft tissue envelope. So you make sure you get an anatomic uh, reduction of your of the fracture. That is really important. And foot and ankle injuries, I mean, it's a very wide topic, but you need to differentiate different types of physical injuries in the ankle and uh, treat them by, you know, if you recognize the type based on classification, you would know what reduction maneuver to perform. And then fixation should be physical respecting. If you are going through the physis, you can go with a smooth K wire, but that's about it. Don't put any tension band plates or anything across the physis. I think the fractures that are high risk are the medial malleolus fracture in children have very good, very high closure rates or very high uh, physical arrest rates. And for foot and ankle, I think, you know, we don't see them too often like, like the Liss Frank and the, and the Taylor's fractures, which are displaced enough for surgery. But especially when you get into the older age group after 10 years, you know, the young adolescent age group, you need to look out for those injuries because then you start seeing them. And, you know, uh, I think that, that these were great, uh, great presentations. And for the femoral femoral neck, I think, 
valgus osteotomy is kind of the go-to procedure for late presentations or non-union uh, uh, patients and you know especially your uh, if your head is is vascular that means that you know if you're if you go to avn that's a, probably the last stage in your femur neck fracture treatment then then you'll have to take help of your adult uh, you know uh, colleague so uh, i really appreciate all the cases by the national faculty i think you did a great job uh, you know sandeep molin uh, you know nice uh, nice cases i'll i'll hand it over to tarul to uh, to uh, make a final thank you oh and, and, and of course leave, we want uh, to thank you, dr wilkins and dr slongo for their comments absolutely so with all the thanks uh, just few announcements uh, to end that the quiz for these two sessions for the weekend will be released on monday uh, secondly for those who have uh, you know put papers for we'll let you know the results tomorrow there have been almost more than 100 cases which we have received and we are going to take some more time and lastly we want to thank all the delegates for attending in large numbers and see you all again next week at 6:15 on saturday for very interesting session on fractures around the knee thank you good night so, everybody so next week we'll have the sports session where you have fractures around the knee and uh, on sunday will be the oration by professor slongo and spine injuries so good night everyone thank you very much again thanks for the great interaction thank you